Hi, lady. Uh, uh, Mr. Brennan. Present. Mr. Rickman. Here. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duval. Present. Ms. Devine. Here. Mr. Davis. Sam, I'm here. Mayor Benjamin. Present, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Gerhalis. You're welcome. Um, Red Medall, you give us a word, please, brother? Yes. O oh Lord, in silence and in reflection, we ask for your mercies to fall tenderly upon each one of us. Allow your grace to cover us with the kinds of decisions we will make as we understand the fabric of our city. Touch us individually and yet touch us collectively. Give, her, give each of us a sense of purpose, a sense of integrity, and a sense of loyalty to our city. Remind us that we can't do anything without your leadership and without your divine presence in our lives. Bless the city of ours and all who dwell therein. We ask it in your name, amen. 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 All right, thank you so much. Um, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Mr. M Mayor, I make a motion. We adopt the agenda as presented with the addition of item 37, a discussion of personnel salaries uh, pursuant to SC code 30-4-70A1. Thank you so much. Is this um, Mr. 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 Mayor, I'm sorry. In addition to that um, item, I would add um, the subheader for fire under right. the personnel matters. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, with those amendments, uh, is there a second? Mr. Mayor, could I yes, ask Mr. McDowell? Could you, uh, could I ask Ms. Mr. DeBall to clarify item number 37? Uh, it, it will be a discussion of uh, the salaries uh, proposed in the budget for 21-22 um, physical year. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. The um, sorry, sorry, we didn't miss anything. Second. All right, moved and, and probably second Any discussion. Saying none with the previous question, the clerk call roll. Mr. Brennan. Yes. Mr. Rickman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duval. Aye. Ms. Devine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the April 20th, 2021 meeting? So moved. I move. Move the second. Any discussion? Move the previous question. Clerk, call roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Ms. Devine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll start my comments after um, Direct Tinsley's report. Sure, Mayor Benjamin. I did have just a few brief items um, of personal privilege. It is National Public Service Recognition Week, and so I know we would all want to acknowledge all the wonderful men and women who work in the city of Columbia to provide wonderful service for our citizens. So I did want to make sure we acknowledge all of them. And then one in particular who is retiring, Ms. Marley Drum, our animal wow. services. Yes, animal services superintendent for so many years, 25 years as a matter of fact. Marley has dedicated her career to helping each adoptable animal reach a forever home in the city of Columbia. 
Marley has many contacts with the animal enthusiast groups here in the city and across the state. And I hope she's listening in. I, I had, oh, there she is. Hey, Marley. Hey, Marley. Um, but Marley has been our superstar to help us partner with Palmetto Lifeline, Animal Mission, the South Carolina Animal Care and Control Association. She took part in the Hurricane Katrina Relief Program. She worked with scout groups on projects around the shelter, organized concerts with Hootie and the Blowfish for the animal mission. I could go on and on. Um, one of the main things that I know many of you on this seat at council will remember is her work with the Mayor's Blue Ribbon Committee and other groups in getting our live release rates to an all-time high of 78% last year. And we know it will be higher this year as well. And so one of the greatest um, memories I have and I'll continue to have about Marley is just her willingness to always share her knowledge with our new employees. Um, she's going to stay on on a part-time basis with us to work with our new superintendent and continuing to connect our staff with her contacts in the Midlands and around the state so that our animal services um, department will continue to flourish. So we appreciate you, Marley, so much. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate that. It's absolutely. been an honor. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Marley. I mean, um, and, and Ms. Wilson couldn't have said it better. Um, you've done a whole lot of great work for, for the city for a very long time. Uh, but but the but the work around no kill I think is a, is a, is a wonderful, um, um, uh, thoughtful and, and compassionate way that articulated our values as as as, as a city, uh, using just using data and humanizing it in a way that um, um, made us all better. So thank you for leading, and um, and I'm glad you stand on in some way. Thank God, uh, <laughs> I'm sure what we do without you. So uh, uh, all the best, my friend. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Thanks, Marley. Thank you, Ms. Will. Well, Mayor Benjamin and Council, it's also National Drinking Water Week. And so you'll see lots of information that we're sharing with our citizens. Um, and I was going to say it's Drinking Week. I was like, okay. <laughs> drinking Water Week. <laughs> yeah, and so our Columbia Water uh, staff is doing a lot to help educate our citizens and making it fun this week. So I'm sure you'll see lots of information about that. And then I know Mr. Duvall hadn't forgotten Tree City USA Award. Yeah. We didn't get to do our normal proclamation celebrating Arbor Day um, this year due to the pandemic. But the city, as you all know, has been designated a Tree City USA recipient for 22 years and running, um, the longest running streak in South Carolina, I believe. And forestry, our wonderful forestry staff, they plant at a minimum of 500 trees per year. And we have to meet these criteria to maintain our designation, hosting Arbor Day celebrations, um, this year, the video that Forestry did was on how to plant a tree. And so we continue to um, thank City Council for your um, intentional ways of making sure that we have tree care ordinances in place and a budget with at least $2 per capita for tree care and removal and plantings. So thank you, City Council, for providing the environment for us to be a Tree City USA award recipient all these years. Awesome. Are we, uh, so we, we do beat Sharon now? I thought, I thought we were in competition. I don't know. Sharon messed up and didn't file one year, so uh, Columbia has surpassed. But Sharon was the first Tree City in <laughs> yeah. South yeah. Carolina. <laughs> I, I noticed the uh, last couple of days from the National League of Cities on uh, an article about tree cities and the tree canopy, and they say there is a tree city world award. These two oh, cities, gosh. Spokane and somebody else, uh, Portland, maybe. The pressure. So <laughs> we're going for the world next time. <laughs> okay. Gonna leave it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good deal. Good. No, thank you so much to, uh, to all of our amazing staff um, uh, for the work that you continue to do. We keep we keep punching, punching, punching. Um, way, way above our weight class, competing on a global level, so thank you.
Yes, sir. Thank you all. And Mayor Benjamin, um, I believe you said we will start with Mr. Tinsley's situational yep. report for the COVID-19 update. Harry? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Council, Madam City Manager again. Thank you for your time. There's some additional information in the inbox on the dashboard report for today's uh, data sets. So worldwide, as of uh, today's report out, there's over 153 million global cases of COVID-19 and over 3.2 million deaths um, due to the virus. Um, here in, in uh, according to the CDC here in the U.S., there are over 32.2 million confirmed cases and five, over 574,000 deaths. That's as of May 3rd report out. Uh, here in South Carolina, in our state, uh, we our, our case count stands, our confirmed case count stands at 483,611. Um, to, date, to date, there have been over 7.4 million tests completed. Uh, new case counts, uh, as reported out as of today, is 294. Uh, you'll recall uh, daily case counts peaked uh, back in January of this year at over 4,500. Uh, the today's positivity uh, percent positivity rate is uh, 5.1 percent, and you recall that in uh, July of last year, uh, July 20, um, it, it peaked at 21.3 percent. Uh, of, of notable report, there are thankfully uh, no new deaths, confirmed deaths uh, reported out by DHEC as of today. Uh, our state death total to COVID-19 uh, stands at 8,383. And here in Richland County, there are over 38,000 uh, cases. They uh, reported 21 additional cases. Uh, our death uh, count stands at 484 for Richland County. Um, and interesting, over the last 14-day uh, reporting period from April, 8, April 18th to May 1st in Richland County, uh, we had over oh, we had 861 new cases. So we're now averaging. Uh, just a little bit over 61 new cases each day. So that continues to trend downward as those reporting cycles uh, indicate. As far as that 14-day uh, reporting period, there was only one zip code, thankfully, that had over 100 cases reported. And that zip code was 29229 with 126 uh, new cases. Also, as of last Thursday, the 28th of April, Richland County's 14-day recent disease activity incidence rate uh, was downgraded uh, to low. Uh, so we are now at a, a considered a low um, uh, with a 3.5% positivity rate. The state's recovery rate continues to be estimated at 97.4%, and the case uh, fatality rate is continued to est be estimated at 1.73%. Uh, daily case counts, as you can see by the data that is reported out each day, continues to uh, roughly or remain roughly stable. Um, and DHEC does uh, not anticipate any large fluctuations in case counts over the next uh, few weeks. Also in our state, our hospitalizations continue to trend downward. Our bed utilization rate is 73%. Uh, ICU bed utilization rate is 66% as of today. There are 386 patients currently hospitalized with COVID-19 in our state. And you'll note that January, uh, back in January, uh, the bed count uh, peaked at 2,417. So we're trending in a positive direction. Also worth noting, uh, DEC data as posted on their website shows that the seven key indicators continue to trend downward or have stabilized. Um, DEC also continues to receive uh, distributions of vaccines. Uh, right now, there's over 4.5 million doses that have been received in our state, with over 3.1 million uh, people having received uh, doses in South Carolina, the last report out. Richland County, uh, over 143,000 residents have, it, have received at least one uh, vaccine, and 808, over 808,000 of uh, those have completed their vaccination process. And the uh, federally supported community vaccine site at Columbia Place Mall has to date administered uh, 4,758 Pfizer vaccines over that two week initial two week period, averaging 339 shots per day. Also, as of May 1st, uh, approximately 32.2% of South Carolina's population greater than 15 years or older have received vaccinations. 
And the CDC, his latest reporting as of May 3rd on COVID-19 vaccinations show 100, over 105 million people have been fully vaccinated or 31.8% of the U.S. population. And 147 million or 44.4% have received at least one dose. Also, those over 65 that have been fully vaccinated uh, is 69.7% with 82 0.8% having received at least one vaccine. Lastly, uh, as of April 27th, uh, we actually reported out 91 cases of the South African variant and 235 cases of the UK variant have been identified in our state. Uh, currently, eight counties and 48 municipalities have uh, mask ordinances in place uh, currently. And uh, that concludes my report. Thank you for your time. So, so Harry, that means, so again, that means we're, are we low, medium, low? I'm, I'm trying to remember uh, um, what you just laid out. So our daily we are, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Mayor. No, please, please, please. As far as those three uh, metrics, uh, the incident rate per 100,000 Richland County is medium. Um, as far as the trend and incident rate over those each 14 day cycle or the past 14 day cycle, it was downgraded to low. And our percent positive continues to be low at 3.5%. It was at 3.8% the last report out for a 14 day report. That's, uh, that's a, that's a one, wonderful improvement just over the last uh, week. And um, uh, la last week I pulled together a, just a, a, a phone call. I um, asked the city manager and, and the county administrator and um, chairman Livingston to want to call, just want to get some sense as exactly where the, uh, uh, where the county was on, on a mask ordinance. Uh, they asked um, Councilman Barron, who chairs the ad hoc committee, uh, be, uh, hoping to find some degree of, of synchronicity as to how we, we would address it. And, and while I think we, we, we shared all the same concerns, I'm not sure that we're, we're, we're gonna be able to, to, uh, to get on the same uh, page necessarily as it relates to timing uh, of, of, our, of our ordinance. Uh, you know, we've been, we've been very, um, Clear that I have, and, and um, uh, with with a, a few um, uh, exceptions, we, we've been we've been we've been fairly uh, uh, together uh, on 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 this from the very beginning, and I think we're going to have to do some really serious uh, uh, dialogue between now and the expiration of our ordinance, which which uh, as, as we all know is uh, it's coming up fairly fairly soon, uh, just over the next couple of weeks. I've been I've been somewhat concerned, and I've articulated this to some of you, uh, and I've heard it from others. A lack of uh, adherence uh, to to the to the to the order. Um, I, I do believe that COVID fatigue is 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 real. Uh, the obviously the inability to, uh, to to identify who has or who has not taken the um, uh, the vaccine uh, is something that just eludes us, and, and will continue to um, uh, elude us. And, I, and my hope is, as we as we go forward, that um, that we will sh shift uh, from a mandatory mask policy to a deep dive into a very aggressive uh, vaccination strategy. Uh, uh, Ed and Sam and Sylvia have, have been very much uh, in the in the weeds in, in the in the community, um, um, recognizing the fact that universal access, which we do have now, is not necessarily the same as equitable access. And making sure that people who need who need uh, access to the vaccine get it literally uh, sent a note off, and I, I haven't checked my, my email reply to recent. I apologize. Asking about about some different tools we might be able to use uh, to not only obviously uh, offer rides to the to the to vaccine clinics, but maybe even take it door to door. Um, uh, literally, find use it using some partnership with some of our, our healthcare uh, institutions, uh, from, the, from the healthcare cooperative to the Joseph H. Neal Center, the Prisma. And getting out into some places where some folks still um, uh, are, are eligible, but but um, either haven't been able to access uh, the vaccines, uh, or or still just getting off of their hesitancy. We're watching more and more people who are just on different personal timelines uh, than than the ones that that we uh, in, enjoy. Um, I um. So I just want to make it clear that I'm I'm, I'm leaning uh, towards uh, the the expiration of of the of the uh, of the of the ordinance. I think I think it's prudent. Um, I, 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 uh, we're, we're either going to have an ordinance that is strictly enforced, and and um, uh, I, 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 um, I believe we're all 
um, very much so indebted to our, uh, our, our city staff, um, our fire marshals and our firefighters for the great and hard work that they've done. Um, um, but we're at a different phase here. And I, I'm so excited to hear this data. We want, we've got to make sure that uh, it keeps trending in the right direction, how, however. So I, I, I'll just be clear, I've been vaccinated. Um, uh, my wife has been vaccinated. Our 16 year old has been vaccinated. My, my 14 year old, almost 14 year old is, is chomping at the bit uh, to be uh, vaccinated. I will be following CDC guidelines as how we go forward. If I'm in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a um, out and about uh, in a group of people, while I, I know someone has not been vaccinated or I don't know that they have been vaccinated, I'll uh, continue wearing my mask. Uh, that, that's a personal decision. We're gonna have to really step up and, and really push people uh, to be um, personally responsible uh, for, for uh, the way forward and realizing that, that we've come way too far and lost too many lives and too many souls to, to, to fall backward. But I would recommend a shift in our strategy uh, from a mandatory mask policy to a very, very aggressive deep dive in ensuring that the vaccine uh, gets to everyone possible that we, that, we, that we lead and partner with a very aggressive campaign because we're seeing interest uh, begin to wane. So we're gonna start seeing um, um, sites begin to shut down uh, as a result of that. Uh, but it is gonna give us a chance to do some, some, some really uh, very clear data-driven micro-targeting uh, strategies that, to, to help take the vaccine to people. And I think that's where our energies and our resources um, um, should be uh, targeted. Uh, so um, I just want to make that clear. Uh, that, that's my, um, uh, 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 my thoughts as to where we ought to, where, where we ought to go. And, I, and, I, and I'll say this again, and I'll be quiet. I know some of you um, uh, may also want to, want to chime in on this. I, I couldn't be more proud of this council. Um, uh, again, I think uh, uh, our approach to public health uh, during the um, um, uh, most significant pandemic we've seen in, in, in over 100 years has been thoughtful. It's been data driven. It's been compassionate. Uh, it, is, it has been focused on making sure our businesses and our critical nonprofits uh, are, are, are stood up. And, and we've been focusing on One True North, which is the preservation of human life. Our folks have stepped up and led by example. Uh, uh, Teresa and her team at the city have been a wonderful example for others to mirror in the way in which this ought to be uh, weathered. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of, 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 uh, of all uh, six of you and your collective leadership, because even again, when we have very stark divisions as to how we've seen this thing, we've been able to come out uh, with, with thoughtful policy going forward. And I, and I hope we can continue to maintain uh, that, that spirit of, 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 of compassionate collaboration uh, as, as we uh, work our way through, hopefully, uh, what will be the winging days of the, of the pandemic. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop. I'll, I'll yield, Mr. Duvall. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I was interested in your comment about you and the county have talked. Their, uh, their ordinance expires on June the 5th Thanks. and ours expires on May the 16th. Yes, sir. Are, are you talking about extending hours to June the no, 5th or I, moving theirs back to the 16th? No, no, no. I, I, what, I, what I said, um, Mr. Duvall, is I didn't, I didn't see synchronicity uh, in, uh, on that piece. Uh, that I, I, no. I'm not inclined to end the, our ordinance, uh, and, uh, and we didn't ask them to, to shorten their ordinance. They, 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 they had a meeting, and you may have gotten a report back, Ms. Wilson, uh, but um, the report the the unofficial report I got back is that is that they're just they're gonna they're gonna continue kind of going forward and seeing how they um uh, how they're gonna deal with it as a county. I was hoping, Howard, that we'd have some some yeah. joint strategy, but it, it, it was not clear that we'd okay. be able to do that. Any other thoughts or, or sentiments that may want to be shared? Ms. 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 Devine. So if there's a hope that we would have something joint, why would we not extend ours to June, whatever, just to keep consistency and not confuse the public? There's no, there's no, there's no, um, uh, I'm, I'm at a point right now where I don't think the public's confused at all. <laughs> the, the, the public more than enough information and they, and they know where they are and whether or not they're wearing a mask. It, it, it's at a point now where it's a personal decision as to whether or not someone's going to do what, what's necessary to protect themselves, their body and their families. Uh, and, and our job needs to be focused on, on, the, on the pandemic. I, 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 
I, but, but the goal going into that meeting was to see uh, exactly um, uh, kind of what the what the sense of the body uh, was, Tamika. Uh, um, but I, 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 I haven't I did. read theirs. Is theirs because we are in Richland County? Does, is theirs very specific to the unincorporated areas, or would it cover the city if theirs continues through June? Well, I'll defer to Teresa Knox on that um, I, I, I have not reviewed their um, their ordinance in uh, in its entirety, uh, and I'm not sure. If, uh, I'm not sure. I'll I'll check on it. Yeah, if we can just check, and then because if theirs continues to June. And people in the city think ours, and not not that they're. I don't know what kind of enforcement they have, but and I don't know what you know the majority of us would do. But um, I'm a little concerned about allowing it expire. Um, I'll be honest. Um, I do agree that there's fatigue, um, uh, but I also know that the news popped up last night about a woman who moved to South Carolina because we had less rules than where she lived. <laughs> um, so I, I, I know you can't mandate, um, a lot of stuff, but it's just, it, it's concerning. And we do know that even though people are vaccinated, we know that some folks are still getting it and we know that'll happen. But I, I think that until we have more people vaccinated, I'm just concerned. I, I don't know what, you know, my hundred percent feeling, but I, I just think that at least if we could be in line with the county our area it would it would probably be helpful yeah I, my, my and, and i i mean i i would love that as well uh i'm not sure if, that, if that's a reality i i've shared my my concerns you know we've, we've been very clear from the very beginning i know i have and and, and several of you have as well that we're going to be driven by data uh and, and and the data as harry just articulated has shown that that, that we're we're in, 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 in uh, a somewhat enviable position i know everybody on this call wants to see that trend continue and, and that and that and that gives you the the the, the hesitancy of wanting to take our foot off, off off the gas, um, but at the very same time, um, I just think it's it's uh, if we're going to follow the data, we got to follow the data. Our, our data has always been there to try and give us the intelligence we need to to, to create policy, and I think it's um, I think it's a fair approach. Um, so, um, Mr. Davis, I <clears throat> I um I don't know have any heartaches about uh, our deadline and, and the targeted date. Um, I did notice, I'm noticing as I move around and as I listen to the media, there seemed to be more attention on the city's ordinance versus the county for whatever reason. And I think, you know, Tamika's point about, um, you know, the, the uh, hand and glove relationship we have to some extent, if that's that is a factor, and then in some other cases, uh, some people don't seem to think about it one way or the other. Um, I would hope that uh, once we reach our target date, make that decision, unless things change, that we uh, sort of still stay in the game in terms of um, uh, retaining our posture of encouraging citizens to be vigilant whether you have the vaccines or not I'm my household is fully vaccinated but although we may say goodbye to the ordinance I think we still have a responsibility to encourage everyone to uh, do the right thing and that is uh, be vaccinated I think the data um, has served its purpose and it, it, uh, it's not disappointing, and, and that's been our guide, and I have no problems uh, following that and keeping an, uh, an eye out on where we stand. And I don't think that the numbers are going to change that much in terms of uh, moving upward. I, I think we'll, we'll hold where we are, and, and at that point, just continue to, to uh, watch the numbers decline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. McDowell? Well, one of the interesting things about mask wearing, and um, I think we've all almost, according to the events that are already scheduled and the continuing events that will come up, um, it's, it's sort of surprising to me that we have not reached normal normalcy yet. 
<laughs> and of course, the events continue. They continue to be there. We've got six events this coming week, this coming um, on the agenda for today. Uh, I'm certainly going to support continuing to wear that mask. And one of the questions that I will continue to answer, to ask of those persons who are sponsoring the event, uh, whether or not CDC guidelines are being adhered to, how many folk are going to be present. Uh, I think we've got a false sense of normalcy because the events are going to continue to amount and they're going to become voluminous at some point. Thank you, Ms. McDowell. Thank you, sir. Other, other comments? Um, one other note I, I did want to make, a point I wanted to make, is uh, I am convinced that the deceleration in the number of cases and the reduction in spread Good. is directly attributed to uh, the work done at the local level, uh, mm -hmm. but like Columbia and Charleston and Greenville in all the towns and counties that Director Tinsley mentioned earlier. I think the local government should be very proud of the leadership role that we've taken uh, here in South Carolina. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right, so um, uh, in, in the absence of, of, uh, of, of, of some affirmative steps in another direction, uh, I, I don't expect that, that, that a renewal would be on the agenda, uh, Madam City Manager. Uh, the, um, uh, I, I would like to have a, a deep dive discussion whenever on, on this. Uh, and I, I sent, I sent a, an email about reverse 911 and some other tools that we might be able to use to identify uh, who wants the vaccine and, and how we can utilize some of these partnerships to take it directly to them. I yeah. think we should be very strategic, creative, and aggressive in, in making it happen. So I wouldn't mind um, uh, uh, pulling together a, a meeting of interested parties in the governmental in the sectoral, let's figure out how we can um, make that happen. And, and obviously, we, we have the benefit, uh, everyone, of following the data between now and the expiration of the ordinance, and, and, and obviously, of course, reconsidering the position. Mm -hmm. I, All right, Mr. Davis. No, I, I agree with that. that. That's my thinking. Uh, at least uh, let, let's, have a, let's have a discussion and see where we all are. We, we can review the numbers um the uh, processes that are in place and where our personal thinkings might be uh, sure. okay. before we well thank you if, there, if there's nothing else for the good of the body we got we got we got more time to um but we can we can keep it keep it moving absolutely manager thank you mayor at this time, we'll continue with city council discussion action items and the Honorable Tamika Isaac Devine will bring us an affordable housing task force report. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wilson, um, to the mayor, members of city council. Just wanted to bring you a brief interim report uh, from the affordable housing task force. Um, we convened the task force, as you guys may recall, actually it was the intent to, to do in March when everything um, slowed down. Uh, so we were not able to actually have our first meeting until the summer, but we've been meeting monthly um, and the task force has done a lot of great work uh, so far. Um, but we are at a point where we wanted to make a presentation to city council and county council, um, get um, some uh, collective agreement as uh, to some of our action items so that we can move forward through the rest of this summer um, aggressively pursuing some of the goals. So I just wanted to quickly, I know we've got a long agenda, so I want to be real quick. And uh, Ms. Hammond will will make sure that you all have this if it's not already in your packets. Um, but first, um, wanted to just recognize the members of the task force. I know we, we appointed them at different times. So I want you all to be aware of the talent that we have currently serving on the Affordable Housing Task Force. Um, we currently have a representative of Comet. Um, John Ando was serving up until uh, he left uh, last month. And so uh, now Pam Bono Reed from the Comet will be representing um, in his place on the task force. We also have Jeff Armstrong from Family Promise, Julianne Avon from Mercy, Reggie Bonner from the Bonner Group, 
Sue Berkowitz from SC Appleseed Legal Justice Center, uh, Brenna Bernardine from Fast Forward, Dr. Brian Grady from SC State Housing, uh, Dylan Gunnels, uh, Tanya Isaac, who is a resident of North Columbia, Ivory Matthews from Columbia Housing Authority, Mary Louise Reich from Habitat for Humanity, Jeff Lairmore from Midlands Housing Trust Fund, Jennifer Moore from the United Way, uh, Shayla Riley, who is an appointee of the chamber and she is with Caldwell Banker, Lala Anna Sauls from Homeless No More, Gregory Sprouse from Central Midlands COG, uh, Council, uh, Councilwoman Allison Terracio from Richland County Council, Regina Williams from Booker Washington Heights Neighborhood, Lester Young from Just Leadership, Jim Zeke from More Justice, and Chris Zimmer from Truist Bank. So you can see that we've got a diversity of, of uh, fields, um, but all very committed to the goal of affordable housing. And so the task force unanimously adopted this de definition that we are asking city council to consider today and endorse. Um, one of the things that we do believe, and we've had this discussion among our council for many years, um, part, of, uh, part of the issue is that there are different uh, definitions of affordable housing. Of course, there's the technical definitions for federal funding or for state housing. There's also the perception that people have of affordable housing. A lot of people uh, only think uh, public housing or, um, or lower wealth communities, um, but they don't look at the gamut of affordable housing. So we're asking council to consider the endorsement of the definition of affordable housing as a continuum of equitable, inclusive, and quality rental and home ownership opportunities for people at every income level, which is critical to creating safe, complete, and thriving communities. Um, we believe that that is inclusive and it, it runs the gamut from home ownership to rental, um, and again, people at all income levels. So people understand that affordable housing is for people uh, who uh, might have low income, live, uh, folks who might be living in poverty. It certainly um, addresses uh, seniors as well as uh, students or and people making minimum wage. So we wanna make sure that people understand the depth of uh, the problem, but the, also uh, the, um, the, how big the solutions have to be. So um, that is the, um, at the end of the report, I'm gonna ask if I can get um, a motion to uh, approve that definition. County Council will be meeting as well and that we're asking them to do the same so that we can operate under that definition as we go out with a, a public awareness campaign. A um, Couple of things I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew as well. Uh, the, we did some research, Dr. Brian Grady has done an excellent job at giving us some statistics um, so just wanted to, to elevate two facts for, for you guys. Number one, there is a statewide shortage of over 87,000 affordable homes that are, and, that are available to extremely low income households. And that is those uh, earning no more than 30% of the area median income. And that uh, statistic is um, according to the National Low Housing um, Income, Low Income Housing Coalition, um, nearly 75 thousand low income renter households in Columbia are ex experiencing particularly unaffordable and substandard housing conditions and they're representing 30 percent of all renters citywide. Uh, so and this number is actually pre-COVID. We do know that that number is larger now. Uh, so we do uh, we would like uh, council and this will be not today uh, but we are going to be looking at the affordable housing that's going to be added into the market this year. Um, and at the end of this year, we would like council um, to look at establishing citywide affordable housing goals on an annual basis. Um, that way we can understand how we're adequately addressing the needs within our community. Um, and if we set realistic goals that we can monitor and measure, then we know where we're gonna go uh, over the next couple of years. Um, we have divided our task force into uh, several committees and have priorities. One is the Accessibility Committee, which will look at um, solutions for making accessible housing uh, for people within special populations. That includes people experiencing mental illness, uh, people formerly incarcerated and returning to our community, people with disabilities, uh, seniors, and other special populations. We also have a subcommittee on financing and we'll be looking at presenting uh, uh, recommendations to this council and county council to consider um, 
uh, for financing affordable housing projects. This will include uh, the consideration of affordable housing tax abatement program, which actually our council has already passed. Um, it stalled on the committee level at county council, but I do know that Councilwoman Teratio is going to attempt to revive that. So hopefully we will have a tax abatement program that is approved by both city and county council that we can make available to uh, affordable housing developers. We also would like to look at social impact funds for private investors, affordable housing bond. Um, one state um, has unclaimed state funds that they uh, set aside for affordable housing. So we'd like to look at the possibility of that, land banks and affordable housing impact fee and a trust fund. Um, and so those are some things that are being researched right now. Um, and so we'd like, of course, to be able to bring back some more information on that. We've got our legal and zoning uh, uh, committee who is looking at legal uh, zoning issues that may uh, help promote uh, the development of a more affordable housing citywide and of course make a recommendation to the county as well. Uh, we've got our partnerships committee who will be looking at other, prof uh, other nonprofits and community-based organizations that can help. Uh, affordable housing is not just a city issue, but we do know if we have partners who can help us, um, that will uh, help us move forward. And then lastly, and the, probably the biggest committee that we have, and we'll be starting immediately with some uh, public education and awareness, um, that committee is looking at how do we uh, promote um, affordable housing and under, make people understand the need of it within our community and what it is. So that's why we're asking for city council and county council to adopt a universal de uh, definition. So as we're going out in the community and talking about what affordable housing is and what the needs are in our community, people understand it um, in a bigger way. And so when we do this outreach, we're looking at bringing in business and community partners, housing developers, our state and local agencies, funding entities, real estate partners, neighborhood associations, uh, the general public, potential home buyers and renters, uh, community coalitions, um, and the local media. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Mayor, that is the report. So I am asking if council would adopt this definition for affordable housing. Um, and, and, and I'll answer any questions if you may have, but, um, and then um, endorse the work of the committee so that now these committee, these subcommittees can actually move forward under the subcommittee uh, definitions that I have mentioned to you guys. Is any, um, so what's the rationale behind the, uh, the, all income levels uh, definition. I mean, I mean, if, if, if we, we know, obviously, according to the, the Low Income Housing um, Coalition you mentioned, uh, looked at the 30% the AMI. I mean, I know traditionally our, our, our focus has been 80% or below. If, if you look at, look at uh, um, workforce housing, um, some of our products even go up to 120% AMI. Uh, all income levels, I mean, so that means we're, we're talking about everybody, uh, regardless of how much people, people earn. So what we what we talked about was, and we kind of toyed with whether or not we would talk about it as affordable housing or attainable housing. Um, nationally, a lot of folks are going to the, uh, the term of attainable housing. And what we talked about is the fact that you have folks who um, within the area, they may not be able to live within the area that they work, even if they make, some people might hear, I make 45,000 and that's a good salary. But if I make $45,000, um, but there's nothing within the Columbia area that will allow me to make sure that's not more than my income, um, too much of my income, then it's not, um, it's not attainable for me. So the all income level, we left it at that because we wanted people to understand. Um, we believe that people feel like the extremely low income and they think folks who are making minimum wage um, and they don't consider uh, students graduating who might get a job that's 35,000, they still need affordable um, housing. So that's why that was the part of the definition. Okay, well, I, I, that's, I just find it curious. So I think it'd be worth taking a look at that definition because obviously if you're gonna focus on, on workforce housing and like my guess is a, a family um, of, of X amount, even earning $45,000 a year would, 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 would easily or squarely fall into that 120, uh, percent AMI number, and uh, if we're going to focus on 120 percent AMI or lower, 
then we might we might need to articulate that uh, because I think part of uh, of that of that policy, if you're going to try to attract ASC, ASG dollars or national dollars here, I, I think just saying this, it's it's open to all incomes. I think might might be a bit of a, a distraction. Uh, so if we're going to uh, train on fire, let, let's let's um, I think we should I think we should think about that. Uh, the um, the other thing I, I read something that said we we hadn't. I, I'm glad you made the clarification. Uh, that we we did pass a tax, the tax abatement policy, which I think is a multi-county industrial park uh, statute as, as well. I'm not sure what 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 format we use. Uh, am I right on that, or or not? You, you're you, you're correct, and it okay. um, got referred to the committee level at county council, and then with their election and then new members, they've not taken it back up. Yeah. Um, but, um, so as you look at the what we passed before, you mentioned we're also looking at M, M, uh, the multi-county industrial park. This is a multi-county industrial park, the same tool we've used for student housing and 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 and, and others. Uh, I just read some of this that we hadn't done anything in this space, and we we passed that years ago. Um, uh, so uh, we we got to I guess get that consensus uh, from the the county. Uh, and I, I would also say let's let's look at a, a deep dive into getting reliable data. I know that. Um, uh, Charleston used uh, community data platforms. We had a meeting with them last week uh, to try and do a real deep dive into uh, exactly, as opposed to the to the narrative driving the data, using the, di the data to drive the narrative. Let's get a really good uh, sense of, of what our challenges are. That 30% AMI, 80% AMI, 120% AMI. So we know what the what the long term uh, goal is. I, I I would be curious to see what what the um, uh, uh, what data um, uh, folks relied on on the, to get the, the, the eighty-seven thousand? And that's a statewide number, like you said. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, what the deficit is 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 there? Um, but community data platforms and, and uh, Taylor can circulate that information around. It was really good. Uh, the data they produced with Charleston uh, just just very uh, recently. But I, uh, I'm I'm fine with moving forward. But I, I think if we're going to be able to track the dollars that we're talking about, I think we're going to have to really clarify that we're focusing on uh, the 30% AMI, 80% AMI, 120% AMI below. I think we just say all income levels, then, then, then you're really not just talking about affordable, even attainable housing. I think that we're just talking about um, something for folks who are, who are middle class or even upper middle class that from the outside looking in. So that's just, that's just a, a piece of advice. But thank you all for your, um, for your work on this. And I would say for the data, Dr. Grady is awesome with data and he has, I mean, he actually has, um, and I can, I know, I think uh, Mr. Rickman had asked for it. I'll make sure that the uh, report that he gave us has in Columbia, the different levels. And so I'll make sure that everybody has a copy of that. Um, but if we are interested as a council, um, uh, Brian would be an, a great person to give us the data from the city specific, um, and then how it relates to the county as well. And he's got he's got that data. He can spout it off in his sleep. Okay. All right. Questions from Daniel. Yeah, uh, I think that's great. If you could share that with us, that'd be be incredible. It's interesting if you look. Uh, Charleston made a big announcement. I think today I saw in the Post and Courier where they partnered with all private developers and they're redoing all the public housing through tax credits, historic credits and other things, but all done privately uh, with developers. So, you know, I hope we're looking at that uh, as well as, as possibilities and for, for the future. Um, I, I, to make any of the information you could share that you, you, sh you said today was all great information. It'd be good for us to have as we move forward so that we make sure that we're cohesively working together to support the opportunities that may arise because, you know, it, it is a uh, an issue in Charleston. It's affecting their, their labor market as well. And I think they're realizing that. I mean, there are restaurants who are closing and other uh, businesses downtown closing because they, they don't have the ability to, to have workforce housing or affordable housing downtown anymore and it's just impossible for people to commute so you know we, we don't want to end up in that same boat so I appreciate what you've done so far thank you have we have we had a presentation from our staff as well to uh, to make a um, our community development people um, uh, particularly uh, obviously I, I go around the country bragging about our mortgage products in particular uh, the way in which they were um, developed and, and, and sustained have we have, have, have does the task force have, 
have they talked about that yet? Yes, that was our first or second meeting and our staff actually staffed all of these committees. So um, we've got Lee, Krista, Gloria, um, and probably somebody else, but at least, Lee, uh, at least Gloria, Lee, and Krista um, staff the subcommittees and they're at every meeting as well as Ms. Wilson comes to the majority of the meetings. Um, you know, she actually, I think she's come to every single one, even if she's had the uh, cop come on. So we've got staff that's there and they're part of the discussion. So yes. Um, what what I will say to that, Mr. Mayor, we 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 know that we are doing a really good job right now um, with you know with home ownership. I think Columbia is certainly a model. Uh, I think we've actually even been recognized nationally on where we are in home ownership. One of the things that we wanted to do is is not take our foot off the gas with, when it comes to home ownership, but recognize that we we are not doing what we need to do in rental products, and so. Um, that's why we kind of, uh, we talked to staff, but we've also brought in Reggie Bonner is on our, our task force, as well as, you know, like I mentioned, Chris Zimmer from Truist Bank. So we're trying to talk about how the private developers can be partnered with us to help provide um, the rental projects and multifamily projects throughout the city. All right. Mr. Um, Councilman Rickman, if I could just add, I did want to say you mentioned about the um, housing authority. Part of the information that we gave last week um, and the housing authorities given, I think that is what um, Ms. Matthews is doing right now um, and the project they're doing is partnering with private developers because they know that they can't do it all themselves. So I know there are a lot of developers who are working with them right this second. Have we gotten that written thought from the housing authority requested last meeting? Yeah, yeah. Any other questions for me? We, well, we have Mayor, I'll take what you just said. Um, we, we meet next Tuesday, so I'll just take this definition back and, and put that back on the table. Um, and then, so I, I won't be asking for a motion today. We'll, uh, we'll bring that to the committee and then I'll bring something back to you guys at our next meeting after that. And I don't, and I, don't I don't, and I mean, I, if, if it, in the, I mean, there's a sense of urgency around the resources coming from the uh, uh, ARP coming, um, uh, through a potential infrastructure plan, even leveraging some of the COVID dollars, I mean, state housing and finance authority. I think they, they got 271 million about to hit the, the street, um, maybe today or tomorrow, with another tranche coming very soon that has to be spent very clearly. We don't want to slow it down. I mean, but 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 maybe potentially looking at revising the definition if in fact slows down the delivery of capital. I think this, we don't want to slow down the uh, uh, have um, uh, Negotiating over over a couple of words, just it's it's just something we might want to uh, consider. Uh, so, Teresa Wilson, we have gotten the uh, written update from Housing Authority as as requested. Yes, sir. I believe Ms. Matthews um, emailed you all after the last meeting, as well as I believe she is available to you today if you need her to answer need her to answer any questions um, regarding the item that's on your agenda. I think she's in our waiting room. Okay, super. And, and I forwarded you some information last night too from um, Ivory and her team. Okay, thank you. Mr. McDowell? Yes, Mr. May, I just want to back up just a little bit. Um, Ms. Devine, as we understand and define what affordable, I think it's affordable housing is. I think I want to echo what you said a few minutes ago, Mr. May. I think it's very, very important that as we define that, that AMI becomes a part of that definition. And um, however, whatever that AMI is, was it's, whether it's 30, I think that needs to be, I think that needs to be clear in terms of uh, helping us to define what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, sir, I'll, I'll take that back. I think one of the things the mayor mentioned, and I, I, would, I would stress that I think if we did you know, 120 or below might be reasonable. Part of the issue is we know that there are there are a lot of folks in the middle class that are being being crunched uh, crunched out, and there are programs for uh, folks at you know different ends of the spectrum. But there are, like I mentioned, you know, folks who are, who might be making you know thirty five thousand dollars right out of school, but not even that much. I mean, twenty five, and they're they don't fit into you know the 20 uh the 30 percent or i think 50 percent right now is like at 40 40 000 for richland county so we wanted to and we know that richland county that number will change so we wanted to get something that covered 
that gap of folks who, you know, might be students, newly graduated. Um, as I mentioned, you know, one of the things we, we talked about too, in the, like those special populations, um, you've got 18 year olds in foster care, they're, you know, they're out on their own. Um, and so we want to make sure we're covering uh, folks who might have a job, might have what most people would consider a good paying job, but still does not allow them uh, to afford to live in the city. So I think if we did that 120 or below, we probably are covering that group um, that is in extreme need that doesn't really get the public resources or the other programs don't qualify the other programs, but we'll look at that and I'll talk to Dr. Grady as well on the committee and I'll we'll bring that back to you guys. Thank you. Um, I'm fine with whatever motion on, on the definition to make it, but I think take it back to, to the group and see if we can, if we might, if it might be um, important to revise it, but we only slow it down of initiative. Uh, if, uh, if we, you know, let's, let's keep on, keep on trucking. Yeah. They won't slow us down. Um, like I said, we've got to go to the county as well. And we want to, we want a universal definition. So since we're meeting one week from today, that's fine. I can take that, that back and we can certainly get that back to the city and the county before the end of this month. All right. Any other questions? If not, let's, let's keep it, let's keep it moving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. At this time, uh, we will begin a series of presentations by our community development team um, to include um, the work of our new program manager and construction management teams um, with the community development block grant disaster recovery grant program update to begin these series of presentations. And um, Ms. Gloria Said, our community development director, is going to lead us in these with the help of members of her team. And I will tell council, as we talked about last council meeting, I know Mr. Davis has been, you know, very diligent as, as well as all of you about asking questions on behalf of the applicants for the program that, you know, has been ongoing since the flood of 2015. And so I, I just wanna reassure council that I'm extremely, extremely dedicated to our staff seeing this through and, and we're doing that. Obviously along the way we've had um, the most recent thing, a pandemic, um, but that has certainly not stopped us from keeping our eye on the prize of helping our citizens that were so impacted by the flood. And what I hope to do today is to show you a little bit the evolution of the program, um, some changes that we've implemented most recently to really, in my opinion, um, you know, put us on the fast track to completion and getting homes rebuilt and rehabilitated. And so this is in a very intentional public um, update so that anyone um, can understand all that has occurred, the money spent, the money's left, and hopefully a recommendation to allocate additional funds towards this effort. Um, we have been in contact with the applicants, um, also making sure that they understand the changes in the program and what they can now expect. And so with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Saeed to get us started. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Ms. Wilson. Thank and you. good afternoon to Mayor Benjamin and members of city council. Um, we're very excited that we have an opportunity to come before you all today to give you an update on the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program, often simply referred to as DR. So if we could go to the first slide. As Ms. Wilson already mentioned, you know, the city experienced a um, national natural disaster back in October of 2015, uh, resulting from um, uh, huge amounts of rain and also floods. So as a result, there are people in the area um, who experienced loss um, of personal property, housing, and also uh, damages to their businesses. So as a result, the city of Columbia did receive uh, two allocations totaling $26,155,000 so the first allocation in the amount of 19,989 was received in 2016 and the second allocation 
of 6,166 was received in 2017. The city had to put together a risk analysis and implementation plan, as well as an action plan. And that was submitted in September of 2016. And then that action plan was approved by HUD in Janu on January 24th, 2017. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we wanna give you a uh, update on the budget. So as again, I mentioned that the city received a total of $26,155,000. And as of April 29th, 2021, the total funds expended are $14,002,919.47. Of that, $6,789,180 has been expended for activity delivery. And as you can see, some of the things that um, are charged to activity delivery include the program management, policy development, case manage management services, and also environmental reviews, just to mention a few. And we also have um, expended 7,213,739 in program funds. The remaining funds total $12,152,80. And based on the remaining funds, we have programmed to pay for activity delivery, 4,271,107.75, and then program funds of $7,880,972. So this slide does show the expenditures of funds as mentioned, and the 7,880 is designated for repairs and replacement of homes. Next slide, thank you. So I wanna take a minute to go over the program descriptions. Um, these are the programs that were included in the uh, original application uh, annual action plan to HUD. And we wanna talk a little bit about what those are and which ones have been closed. So we're going to start with the City of Columbia Homeowner Assistance Program, also referred to as CHAP. The design of that program is to provide up to $150,000 for rehabilitation, repair, or reconstruction of owner-occupied households with major damages directly related to the October 2015 disaster and with unmet needs exceeding 25,000. We also have the minor repair program known as MRP, which provides up to 25,000 to low to moderate income owner-occupied households that sustain minor damage with unmet needs. In addition, there's the Elevation Repair Program, which is also referred to as ERP. That particular program is closed, and that program provided up to $20,000 for elevation reimbursement to owner-occupied households. The following two slides provide a brief description of our beneficiary programs that provide direct assistance to households and small businesses. Next screen, please. Oh, you get, you're there, all right. <laughs> so here we have the FEMA Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, also referred to as HMGP and HMGP Match. That program is also closed. And with that particular program, <clears throat> there were 22 uh, homeowner served, um, a property owners, owners served who sold their storm damaged homes to the city of Columbia to create permanent green space. One of our programs also included multifamily affordable housing fund. That program is also closed. The city partnered with subrecipients and developers to finance the new construction of affordable rental housing or reconstruction of damaged units. Next. We also have uh, in the action plan a small repair, small rental repair program. That program is also closed. That program was designed to provide funding to repair storm damaged rental properties of one to four units. And the assistant caps were $100,000 for single unit rental properties. 125,000 for duplexes, 150,000 for triplexes, 
and 175,000 for quadplexes. The Small Business Disaster Recovery Program is also closed and that program provided financial assistance in the form of forgivable loans up to $20,000 to impacted businesses. Next. Now this slide shows the awards that were made under the prior program manager, which is Landmark Consulting. And they were the program manager from December 2015 through December 7, 2020. So as you can see under the CHAP program, there were seven awards made totaling $406,428. Under ERP, there were three awards made totaling $61,955. Under HMGP, there were 22 award made. awards made, totaling $874,041. Under MRP, there were 12 awards made, totaling $535,157. And under SRRP, there were five awards made, totaling $132,534. With a total of 49 awards, totaling 2,010,115. For the Small Business Disaster Recovery Program, those accomplishments are there were four awards made, totaling $80,000, which gives a total of 53 awards um, made up in, by the prior program, program manager. Next, please. We also funded two multifamily affordable housing uh, projects. And those include Lord Place, which consisted of, uh, consists of 87 units, and the Point of Elmwood, which consists of 58 units. Um, the Office of Community Development held, had sole responsibility for the family programs. So our staff saw to the completion these two projects that are now fully leased and they provide 145 new units of affordable housing for low to moderate income households. And I know that's only a drop in the bucket in terms of, you know, what the needs are, uh, but we are excited about the fact that we were able to use the funds to have uh, an impact, impact all those small. That's a significant accomplishment. It's yeah, I think we, I think, and in, in, in I'm not sure we did a strategic media around either one of those. Um, and it's 100, almost 150 units and some creative public private partnerships, including, you know, wonderful, and I, I'm sorry, Ed, if I cut you off, a wonderful leadership, uh, a second that church and community leaders in the Edgewood community. Uh, so don't, don't it's, it's, um, we need a lot more, but that's, that, those are significant uh, successes. We got to make sure we, uh, we toot our horn a little bit more when we uh, when we ring the bell like that. Ed? Yes. Gloria, if you would go back one slide, please. Okay. Here? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Gloria, from 2015 through 20, um, a raging concern for me and I, I guess for others is that there has been, there are rather houses that are still Folk are, not, folk are not living in their homes after the flood. Um, tell me a little bit about how we move forward. There are persons who are still homeless because of the 2015 flood. Have we created a priority list of those persons who have not, um, who have, who, who's still not in their homes? Um, is there a priority list? So Councilman McDowell, that's a very good question. Um, and I think those questions would be answered as we go through the presentation. Okay, I'm sorry. We'll see okay. how we've set the uh, priorities and the prioritizing methodology moving forward. Okay, that's fine. Because I'm, I'm, I know some years ago there was a situation where we just literally bought that piece of property. And I think one of the acronyms, uh, and I don't know, I don't remember which one, where a house was bought. Hello, city. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Where what? a house was bought and uh, was turned into green space. 
what I'm saying is that if this is going to be presented later on in this presentation, I think we need to um, look at that and particularly those persons who have been out of their home for five to six years. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, we'll certainly um, go through the presentation and can answer some of those questions and discuss And I'm that. sorry. Well, yes, ma'am. No problem. Reverend McDowell and, and all of council, I really asked um, Gloria and the staff to set the presentation up this way so you would see, I think, as I said at the beginning, kind of the evolution and why um, really there's a demarcation to be made in the sand, so to speak, at the point of where we are now um, with the new program manager and construction manager. I think it's going to become a little bit more clear to you as we go through these slides, Reverend McDowell, but I did think it was important to show the past accomplishments, certainly, but yeah, also yeah. There's, um, obviously a, a lot more work to be done and, and yeah. how we're gonna go about getting that done for the individuals you're speaking of. You're absolutely right. And the glory, glory of course, I think you can move the slide over now. <laughs> I think you can move it <laughs> yes, over. Sir. Uh, I, I just wanna say the point at Amwood, the point at Amwood is one of those projects where I think uh, we did an absolutely wonderful job over there. Uh, I've had a chance to visit. Several of us have looked at Amwood, the point at Amwood, and those dollars were well spent. Thank you all very much. Yes, sir. It's uh, a lovely project, and so is Lorick Place. If you haven't seen that, I encourage you all uh, to take uh, time to, to, to visit that site as well. So the next slide, just to piggyback on what Ms. Wilson said, this is a great segue um, to introduce the new, um, one of our new teams. Um, <clears throat> As you all know, this decision was made back in July of last year to uh, look at a new program manager to complete the program and close it out. Um, and so I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the new program management team, which is ICF. Um, there are two project managers, um, well, subject matter experts on this one. And we have Dolores Acurso, who's the principal in charge and Sue Salvin, the project manager. Uh, there's Candy Anderson, who's the applicant and constituent services lead. Robert Soto, who handles data analysis, quality control and reporting lead. And then we have two of our subject matter experts, who's Jane Wyndham and Armand McNelly, who specializes in uh, a very complicated but important process when you're dealing with older homes as it relates to lead-based paint, we're happy to have them on the team as well to assist with that piece in terms of making sure we adhere to policies and procedures in that regard. Next slide, please. Here, we're going to go over some of the roles and responsibilities for ICF, the program manager. Their roles include review of CDBG program policies and procedures, respond to HUD monitoring letter, update the CDBG DR website, review all active housing applicant files, contact and communication with applicants, inbound and outbound calls, emails, letters, and postcards, and also to develop and implement scanning, <clears throat> implement, I'm sorry, an applicant system of record, which they've done that as well. Um, very excited, very easy to use. And all the scanning of files and documents have been completed and the SharePoint has been uh, developed under their leadership. Next. We also did something a little different this time, taking a two-pronged approach where not only did we have a program manager, but we also recognized the importance of having a strong construction team on board. And so <clears throat> the uh, city engaged SVP as a sub-recipient who specializes in construction, rehab, and new construction. And on that team is Rick McDermott, the project, project manager, 
Maria Gonzalez, Case, case Management Manager, Ken Linhart, the Construction Manager, and Paul Florina, Support Ops, IT, and Compliance Manager. Some of their um, SVPs, roles and responsibilities, again, as I stated earlier, includes construction case management. They assist applicants through each step of the construction process. They perform damage assessments, construction contractor procurement, asbestos and lead-based paint abatement. They manage the construction management piece of the project and also perform weekly inspections of all work in progress and provide a one-year warranty on any work um, that's completed so that the homeowner can have some recourse if things don't work out within that time period. Next, please. So to your question, Councilman McDowell, you know, we talked about uh, priorities and people who have needs. Um, but in regards to the priorities, uh, one of the things that we said in the beginning in the program is that we wanted to look at and do our best to serve as many people as we could. So in addition to being low to moderate income, the four other characteristics you see here were used to define the most in need. And what that is, is if you're elderly, that means not if you're elderly, but elderly people 62 and older receive priority. And that's 62 plus any household member. If you're disabled, if there's any household member in, in, in the home, you're considered uh, a priority. If you're female head of household with children under the age of 18, and if there are health and safety items as defined by city ordinance. Next. So we also came up with a prioritization methodology. So in consideration, consideration for the elderly, um, with, more, with more than one priority, you certainly want to take that into account. And then consideration for applicants with more than one priority. All applicants in a cohort will be no, notified and will be told what documentation is required to move forward. And once documentation is provided, the application is processed and moved to damage assessment. And so let me say this, at, as the program moves forward. Our methodology to prioritize applicants is aligned with the action plan and the program policies and procedures with the understanding that the program does not have sufficient funding to serve everyone who is in need. So I just want to say that and you'll see what our proposals are toward the end of the presentation. So we will be moving the applicants to damage assessments individually as cost information for each has been confirmed. And this will ensure that we have sufficient funding to serve all those moving forward. And we do not set um, expectations for folk, you know, that perhaps we cannot help. Next. So here we're talking about the basis of our average estimated costs. So we did have to look at the estimated costs for repairs and we came up with $190,000 per applicant to determine the funding need. So the cost is based on increased cost of building materials, environmental remediation costs like the lead and asbestos, and the need for voluntary relocation assistance. It should also be noted that the program assignment, CHAP versus MRP, will not necessarily determine the level of repairs, but the current damage assessment will. So the increased cost of building materials have gone, on, gone up. In fact, CNBC reported just last Friday that lumber prices for a eight house has gone up $36,000 per household. And so that's a huge amount of money. Um, that's one of the things that we had to take into consideration with the cost. Also the remediation of environmental hazards which is required by HUD and the EPA for the safety of both homeowners and workers. And as you all are aware, a lot of the houses in the city of Columbia were built before 1978. So there is a lot of environmental re remediation that will have to be performed. Also, there's a need for financial support for those households 
that will need to vacate their homes while the repairs are being done or their house is being rebuilt. And so as SVP is securing the estimate for the work, we feel it's, it's, it's prudent to include them in the average cost, which is the $190,000. And at this time, what I'm going to do is ask if Rick McDermott, he is the program manager for SVP, could just join in really briefly to give you a little more information on how we came up with the $190,000 estimate. I think that's important. Ms. Saeed. Available? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilman McDowell. Yes, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Uh, when we do the, as we look over the prioritization of the different uh, levels, let me ask you this. I guess there are persons who's been out of their homes for five to six years. How does that figure into the prioritization? Well, the prioritization is is not based on whether they're out of their homes. Councilman McDowell, what we're looking at is whether they're elderly, whether they're disabled, um, whether they are a female and head of household, and also whether they're safety and uh, safety issues. So if they're out of their homes, it, it, it apparently it must be because the house isn't, isn't livable, correct? That's correct. Okay, so based on the methodology, <clears throat> Once you see in the, in the frames that we have ahead, those could be some of the people that you're speaking of potentially. I don't know specifically, because I don't know who you're talking about. I don't think we want to mention that on a public no. forum. But, but if, it's, if it's safety issues, those are some of the people who, who are a, a high priority. Um, but we'll show you how that methodology works whether they're four priorities, three, two, or one. So we'll talk about that. Okay, so I'm getting ahead there. Okay. A little bit, sir, but that's okay. We appreciate the question because I know you all were, were really looking forward to an update, so. Well, and I don't, and I don't know that um, Reverend McDowell's necessarily jumping ahead. I think he's factoring in another issue that is probably weaved into these various um, priority levels. I would venture to say, Reverend McDowell, as Gloria did as well, that the individuals or applicants you're talking about fit in one of the categories. I mean, a vast majority we have found to be elderly or definitely the safety issues are there. So as she stated, I mean, we can get with you later to kind of cross-reference certain um, applicants or individuals you're <laughs> referring to. But once you see how the prioritization of different rounds that they're about to discuss of these cohorts of applicants have, um, have been determined with the new program manager and, and construction management teams, I think it'll probably make more sense to you that these people are covered through these various prioritizations that um, Gloria mentioned. If that makes sure. sense, it's not just it's it's not just how long they've been out of the home or if they've been out of the home at all. Um, but you're probably capturing some of the same applicants you're talking about with the way we we're doing it now. The way we prioritize that the prioritization, of course. Um, I think in some of those instances, one or two of those priority will sort of fit into that conversation that I could possibly have with Gloria or with yourself. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm fine. Ms. Wilson, I have a quick question before we move on from Saeed. Sure. Um, Ms. Saeed, so if I'm looking at slide two, there's roughly remaining funds of $12 million left and you break it down active, uh, Activity delivery is tagged at 4.2 million and program funds at 7.8. How, so we have a wonderful team on board now to deliver ICF, Livable and SBP. Yes. Are, are those management services, the program management, everything, which, which pool of money is that coming out of? So the, for the remaining funds, the 12 million 152.80 out of that activity delivery, the 4 million 271, that's 
that's what's going to be used to pay for your uh, subrecipient and your uh, program manager, as well as um, environmental assessments that we're still going to need to pay for. Okay, so all our, all our consultants and program management team is coming out of that roughly third uh, of the 12 million. That is correct. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. So um, again, um, uh, if, if Rick McDermott, um, Rick, if you can just give a, a breakdown of some of what you've seen out in the field, um, just really quickly to talk <clears throat> about the $190,000 estimate that, that we're using uh, for our projections. Certainly, Gloria, I'd be happy to do that. Again, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, I'm Rick McDermott, I represent uh, the people who work uh, SBP, a nonprofit, trying to shrink the time between disaster and recovery. We're really excited to get things rolling. Uh, we've been out to 20 homes assessing the damage and figuring out what it's gonna take to bring these people back to a uh, safe, sanitary, and secure housing situation. And the numbers that I'm gonna present to you uh, and how we got to that number are based on the conditions we've observed during the visit. I'd like you to note that I've actually personally been on the first 18 inspections, climbing on roofs and attics, crawl spaces, uh, to get a feel for the condition and to uh, what it's gonna take to move forward, uh, move the citizens forward under our watch. Uh, one of the goals of rebuilding uh, is to rebuild the lost trust with the citizen. We do that through frequent, transparent, and personal communications. So our construction case managers are talking with these citizens each week, uh, usually multiple times during the week. And I personally have met with each citizen uh, or will meet with them if I haven't already uh, to help reinforce the message uh, and help kind of build trust in our communications in the process. So as we take a look at this accurate assessment and updated projections to make sure we don't put the city in a position of promising the citizen that they can help them and then having to say, oh, gee, we were wrong. We didn't have enough money. Uh, we're going through the cost estimate. If you take a look at the previous contractor, they did about 49 families uh, for $2.1 million, and that comes out to 41,000 per completed project. Now, these were all of the easy homes. Uh, they were under 40 years of age. They had no asbestos, no lead-based paint, uh, kind of some minimal damage, uh, and they were uh, very close to the actual event itself. So uh, as we've gone out and taken a look at the estimates, our result of our inspection is there's a, basically a difference of about 250% between what was there uh, and the easy homes and what are now the homes that were built in the 1920s uh, who have a tremendous amount of asbestos lead-based paint uh, as well as uh, additional damage. Uh, also part of the cost comes from the fact that not only is it a change in scope, but there's an increased cost of materials. If you look at like OSB board prices, they're three times higher uh, than the last year. Uh, two by fours are up by 158% from just last year. Uh, and uh, studs are up 168, uh, 164%. If you go back further and take a look at January of 2017, a thousand board feet of uh, uh, wood was $220.05. The spot price as of noon today for that same wood is $1,609.04. So it's only almost seven and a half times more than when the previous contractor started their inspections. So all I say all that to say that that takes us to 113,000 for uh, what we believe is gonna be the repairs, not including abatement. Now from the homes that we've seen so far, our abatement costs are at an average about 25,000 per file. Uh, given the nature of the abatement and the fact that there are extensive repairs, uh, there's probably going to be a need for about $9,000 worth of temporary housing. Uh, and that takes us to basically 147,000 and that doesn't even factor in any of the replacements. Now our initial assessment is that we're going to need to replace about a third of these homes. I was in a home two weeks ago where the floor was a trampoline. Uh, it was, uh, it's an old uh, slat and uh, plaster lab home. Uh, it's got a lot of termite damage. So there's no there's no good foundation for this home, so it's going to have to be replaced. And that's kind of some of the things we're seeing. Uh, if you factor in that uh, one third of a replacement value or a replacement volume, uh, then it takes you to about 195,000. Now we've been in conversation with uh, the city about some things that we can do to institute some cost savings. 
uh, we believe we can take at least 5,000 out of that by focusing on the home itself, by ensuring that we're meeting construction code compliance standards, but not repairing non-essential items and non-housing items like fences and other property related code items that do not affect the safety, the sanitation, the security of the home. And that gets us to our planning factor of about 190K. Uh, once we've got 10 homes complete and our first five replacements under contract, we'll be able to revise the figures, give you a, a tighter analysis and a, a tighter projection on that. Uh, Gloria, subject to questions, uh, I relinquish the floor back to you. Rick, thank, thank you for that uh, update on, on Gloria, how the I'm, I'm, this, is, this is Howard yes. Duvall. I've, I've got a question for Rick. Uh, Rick, are any of the houses you're working on valued at 190000 now? Uh, uh, so that's not the value of the house. That's an all-in cost uh, because you've got factors in there. Uh, probably not in terms of that. On the other hand, as you look at the cost of money, if it costs me 190000 to replace, but I could re I can repair it and give you a good 30-year home for $170,000 and service someone else uh, in terms of that. So we, we believe that this is going to be an average cost of, of cost. If you've got some historical homes, I know that we worked in, I worked for the state program. We worked on one historical home that between the asbestos and bringing it up to code and the fact that you couldn't replace things, you had to repair things, it was almost $300,000. Uh, we've got a home that we're looking at right now that's probably only going to cost about $65,000 uh, in terms of construction costs, but there's probably going to be uh, another ten dollars to 12000 uh, in terms of uh, probably putting this family up outside while we take care of the abatement and things like that. So that's going to be a lower cost pile. I personally believe that, that we're going to come in uh, significantly under this number. But to make sure that we don't put the city in a position of promising something to somebody that they then can't deliver, we've used this as an initial planning factor. This is our best guess and uh, being uh, almost pathologically pessimistic as opposed to pathologically optimistic of it will not cost more than that. We believe that we'll be able to service everybody and there's no way it will cost more than this. I think it will come in a lot less. I don't know, sir, did that, did that kind of answer your question? Well, uh, <laughs> yes and no. Uh, 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 you kind of some, some of those houses are not. I, I would hate to put our hundred and seventy five thousand dollars in. Well, we're, we're we don't intend to do that. So if the home if the home has a decent uh, structure, uh, and we can salvage it, uh, you know they, they go from very small homes to very large homes. So there's one we're going to put probably 110, 120 in. It's a twenty seven hundred square foot home, uh, very nice home. Uh, a lot of our cost is going to be the fact that the left side facade brick has pulled away. Now, there's nothing structurally wrong with that home. It would be a shame to knock that one down and spend 160 or 170 thousand rebuilding uh, and give them maybe a 1,400 square foot home when he's got that, and we can we can actually save a little bit of money. You are absolutely right. There are some homes out there that aren't worth you know 25 thousand dollars. Those homes will end up obviously replace it. Uh, but it is a, it, it's always a, a cost thing of, can I repair, is there enough structure left that I can repair it for significantly less money and still give a 30, 40 year life to that home than building new? Okay, thank you. Great, and yes, sir. Uh, let me ask this question, two, two questions actually. Of course, when I read that and it says that an average cost of one hundred and ninety thousand dollars, it gives, and I think Howard is right on target. It gives the it gives the um, it gives a view that you're going to spend one hundred and ninety thousand dollars per per applicant. This, I think that needs to be that in itself needs to be clarified because what you said. We can spend up to a hundred and ninety thousand dollars if that is the actual cost that will take to uh, repair that home. Is that right? 
It's actually a, an average cost across all files. Uh, so as I said, you know, there may be a home that because of abatement and other things, uh, uh, you know, structurally reinforcing uh, the lot and things like that, it might be 250000 and the next home might be 75000 so we, we could So we could spend up to $190,000. Councilman, this is Gloria. So I'll, I'll answer this way: when we we had we had we had to come up with a um, worst case scenario in terms of costs. So the best way to look at how many we could serve based on that amount and move forward, and based on what we know about the the maximum construction um, cost and any uh, environmental cost and the fact that we may have to have relocation, we estimated it to be the $190,000. Now, okay. clearly what we are hoping will happen is that's not gonna be the case. So, but I think it's best to, you know, use a, a higher number and we have money left over to help more people as yeah. opposed to using a lower number, you know, and then we gotta figure out, okay, we're not gonna be able to help as much people as we estimated. Okay. That's fine. So it, it, it is just an average cost so that we can move the program forward and start serving individuals. Now, I just wanted to know whether or not the way it reads or the way I read it is mm -hmm. that we got $190,000 per applicant. Second is, question, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, sir. We'll, we'll be providing them with the service that is appropriate for that particular property. All right. That sounds good. Rick, let me ask you this. I understand that you've surveyed several homes, uh, looking at uh, damages and that sort of thing. Uh, yes, sir. That, how much of that surveying um, is flood related? Uh, f well, okay, let me separate it between flood related and storm related. Okay, most of the homes <laughs> that we have uh, were not directly flooded in terms of rising water what the vast majority of them had was wind driven rain uh and it is it is it becomes a little bit difficult to uh to say how much was specifically for this storm versus how much is as a result of the fact that the storm was almost six years ago now uh and so uh uh, there is, there is, uh, and the challenge becomes also when you're talking specifically about the LMI community, uh, you know, you know, FEMA uh, historically kind of underpays uh, in terms of that. And so, you know, if they had a blue tarp on in 2015, you know, in December of 2015, and it's still there three years later, well, you've got, you know, maybe it was uh, $2,000 for a roof repair initially, and now it's a roof and you've got uh, you know, joists and rafters, and you've got uh, mold and the insulation, and now you've got some vertical wall damage. Um, so uh, it's really a compounding factor for that uh, in terms of that. Now, I've been to the, the first 18 inspections, and I, I, um, uh, I have a Medicare card and great grandchildren, but I get up in the rafters, and I get up in the crawl spaces, and uh, and everything else like that for two reasons. First of all, I wanna make sure that my folks understand that that's my expectation when they go out and inspect. And number two, I want the citizen to feel confident that they're getting a good, a good assessment of their actual home uh, in terms of that. So in, in answer to your question, I, I couldn't give you a percentage of it. I can just tell you that, that uh, there's an absolute need for these folks. All right. Thank Davis. you. Um, um, that 190 number, uh, I'm, I agree that, that that's not a, I don't know that that is a, a, a good base figure. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what, what, what you're saying with the, with the conversation going about what needs to be done, what was done, what has not been done. Based on all the conversations I had, and one as late as uh, Sunday night from a uh, constituent, can't call her name, but I'm sure Ms. Um, 
city manager knows her. I'm, I'm hearing about some things that are uh, being planned in terms of what's going to be done, what's going to be looked at. But it was my understanding that a lot of this was already done. And if the and so it's still the, the I'm I'm anticipating another delay where there are people who are constantly asking me about when are we going to do and that we've looked at files and we've gathered information on, on a lot of these uh, residences. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of scared, honestly, honestly, about how long it's going to take again if I'm hearing a lot of the prelimin same preliminary things that were supposed to have been done or that was done. So, um, Councilman, if I could address that, Blurry, if you don't mind. Um, I'm, I'm responsible for construction and I put a lot of pressure on my folks to get stuff out the door. Uh, right now, right, uh, we're working through uh, some preliminary designs and things like that so that we can, once we hit the ground running, we don't run into any problems with, with codes or design districts or anything else like that. Uh, the citizens absolutely told me personally, look, I've been inspected to death. And I said, I, I, right. you're preaching to the choir. Amen. You're absolutely right. But I want to just give you one example. Uh, I went out to a particular uh, home and, uh, uh, and, I, and I'm not trying to say anything bad about anybody else, but this citizen had been told that their roof was perfectly okay and that their roof was, they weren't going to touch their roof. That was a previous damage assessment. I will tell you that that roof was bad in 2015. That roof probably hadn't been good since about 2010. Uh, there's obvious storm damage. There's uh, all sorts of things wrong with that roof. I almost fell through that roof and that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, and so, and it was right by where there's a leak that you could see that, that had been there from, from actual and impact damage. Um, and so, so to have a damage assessment that says, we're not going to do your roof, but then we're going to give you upper cabinets, which are completely, perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with them. Uh, that tells me that there wasn't the level of detail that was proper for the citizens on that particular home. And so, I'm not going to trust somebody else's work. I'm going to go out there. Now, we got files on the 13th of March. Or, I'm sorry, the 17th of March, and we've already been out to uh, 22 homes as of, as of today. Uh, and I intend to put my first bid package out uh, within the next two weeks. Uh, that starts the process for the first home. Uh, my goal is to get uh, the first uh, 35 to 40 homes uh, and, uh, and I'm overstepping what Gloria has in terms of the number, but I'm counting on some cost savings, but I put, I put hard marks on the wall, uh, but I want those, uh, under construction in the first series of them, uh, done, uh, before, uh, fall. So that's, that's what I'm working towards. I haven't failed at anything in my life and I don't intend to start now. Thank you. I, 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 I clearly understand you and, and what you've got to go through. Uh, but you know, when I look at the numbers and, and we go back to from whence we've come up to this point uh, and the uh, kinds of uh, complaints and requests I've been getting since <laughs> since the storm. Uh, yes, sir. A, a, a number of those damages did not go that high. As you, you were talking about uh, some windows that may have been you know, damaged and so forth, um, the footing as I was talking about an elderly person, the footings of, of, a, of a ramp and a small porch area. Uh, and we just haven't gotten there yet. But also on the scale, we've uh, purchased houses that have been where the area was flooded and we, and we purchased those houses. And, and uh, I've gone through areas where we were paying to elevate houses so they don't flood anymore. Uh, I would venture to say that when we look at the average cost of, of this list, uh, I would also say in the Ed's area also, the, the costs are not uh, as high as they were elsewhere, but we haven't gotten to them yet, and that is a frustration. So um, I'm I'm just uh, I, 
I, I don't want to show my frustration, but 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 what I'm hearing, I've heard before. Uh, in all honesty, to the people that have been um, really pleading, and and uh, sounds like we're gonna go down that court again. I don't know how many baskets we're going to make, but it's. Um, I, yes, sir, I, Mr. I just, Mr. I'm sorry. I'm well, just Mr. not comfortable with what I'm hearing. Well, Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis, yes, we're not, we're not going down the same. We're not even playing in the same court <laughs> anymore. So I, I totally understand your frustration, but I just have to say that, um, you know, this is my decision ultimately to go down the path we're going down now. And it is for the reasons of frustration that you just said. So we are not even playing ball in the same court anymore. Um, I know that SBP's reputation, if, and we, we kind of breezed over their roles and what they're doing um, for you today, but I can give you a lot more information about their level of expertise and what they've done as um, working on construction management from the flood for the state and then all across the country. And um, I'm very, I feel very comfortable and confident that Rick and his team will get us there. And I feel even more comfortable and confident that he is putting his word and his work on the line publicly, um, expressing to our citizens um, his own personal um, review of these homes to the point of acknowledging where things that may not have been identified before are being identified now. So, I, you know, I know that it makes you um, still question it as you should for your constituents, but, but this is where we are and this is, this is the right direction to go now moving forward. Well, I, I know you've put a lot of effort into this, but I, I just could not, I would not be honest with, uh, about the process and, and, and how we've gotten to this point and why in other areas, um, folks have closed shop. The, the damage, the, the, the uh, investments and all that were done. And here we are, it's, it's like we're still starting over, starting from point one. That's not, uh, I, I don't know, I, I just. Well, I'm not sure about which other areas or how other entities have um, done their programs, but I, you know, I'm responsible for this one. And so when I have, you know, when I see that we need to go in a different direction, that's what we're doing. Okay, I understand, but just, I just, um, it's, uh, it's, this was an aching, it's aching to me no, to sorry. hear that we have, well, where there were flood damage and so forth. We've gone in, we've purchased property, you know, and turned them into green space. We've, uh, I know we've, I've seen houses where we've, whatever the negotiations were, that, and folks were reimbursed, but they're having to jack, you know, elevate the houses above the level that they were prior to the flood. We've done all of that in some well, areas. We some well, of this we have stuff, to be clear too, Mr. Davis, yes. about what was done by whom. You know, there were private homeowners who made I, decisions to do some of what you're describing. I, I under that. I understand that. I'm just saying that um, it's um, just it's heartening I, for me to. <laughs> there's a storm at my house, so I hope I don't lose power. Um, well, right. you got it. Okay, I, I don't want to belabor this. Why don't we just get together? I'd like to talk with the team and uh, maybe kind of just uh, re-review some of uh, today's uh, presentations. I think that may um, help shed some light on uh, where I need to uh, place my focus moving forward and uh, work with staff to see that we, um, we accomplish the goal. Ms. Wilson, she may have lost. Yeah, maybe. I'm sorry. Yes, sir, I can hear you. Oh, okay. well, Ms. Wilson.
let me just say a word of appreciation. I think we're on the right path. We are on the right path. This has hey. been, I'm sorry. Hello? Yes. Hello? You're, you're there? Maybe the stone. Reverend Medell, go ahead. I'm having some problems with power. Just you can okay. keep talking though. I'm sure okay, Gloria, can... Gloria and Rick, can you hear me? Yes, um, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, let, let me just say a word of appreciation. I think we've 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 jumped another hurdle because the hurdle for me, of course, has been a, um, a compassion and a passion for those persons who are still homeless and not in their homes. From what I gather from the new configuration, uh, what I see is um, a plan to get at the heart of the issue and that's to get folk back, either back in their homes or repairing their homes. So I think we're on the right track. And if we stay on that track, I think we are probably headed towards a sense of uh, accomplishment. So I'm, I'm appreciative and I don't want to sound contentious at, on, in any way, but I do want to say that there again are persons who are, for lack of a better word, suffering because they're still out of their homes. Thank right. you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So I do appreciate that. So um, the, we will talk about um, some of those folk that we are looking to help. Um, if we could go to the next frame. So what we've done is we, we have uh, come up with um, 23 applications so far. We call that our round one um, that have already gone to damage assessment. Um, and uh, most of them were identified by the prior program manager and then some were added by staff. Um, but there's a total of 23 and 17 out of the 23 of those have elderly priority. And so the total to fund the 23 in the elderly, uh, the 23 in the round one is $4,370,000. And that's at the estimated 190. And so, but to your point, if it doesn't cost 190, which everything won't, but we're setting that as the bar just so that we can make sure we can serve the folk that we say uh, that we've done the damage assessments for thus far. So let's go to the next frame, please. So let us give you an example of the round one applications. And you know, we've already talked about how we're. Um, prioritizing uh, applicants and the methodology that we're using. As you can see from this chart, out of the 23 that have gone to damage assessments, it shows that five of those applicants have three priorities. So if you look at CHAP, you see that there's two applic applications under CHAP. They have three priorities. One is that they're elderly, they have a disability, and they also help and have health and safety issues in the home. Another, there's one that's in CHAP that is elderly, has a disability, but is head, a uh, female head of household. And then there's another where you see that there are two in MRP, and there are three priorities for them. They're elderly, disabled, and have safe health and safety items, uh, issues in the home. So you see how it's being broken down by priorities based on who we, we are serving. Do you all have any questions about this? We can certainly come back to it um, because I do wanna go through the next round. So most, just so you know, most of the applicants in this cohort were already in the pre-construction with the prior program managers. And those that were not, again, as I mentioned earlier, were added based on health and safety issues. Next. So we also have a round two um, that's, that's been um, reviewed. And so in the round two, 
Uh, there are 18 applications that are ready to move to damage assessment. And 16 out of the 18 also have a elderly priority. And so if we were to serve the 18 in this, in round two, that total is $3,420,000. Next. So here's a breakdown of what the applicants look like in round two. As I mentioned, there are 18 applicants. Um, and you can see how it's broken down in terms of priority. And you can see where there's two in this round that meet all four categories of the priorities. They're elderly, they're disabled, they're female head of household, and they also have health and safety issues. So again, this speaks to the methodology on that we're trying to um, make sure we serve those most in need first, based on the funds that we have remaining. Next. So in terms of the program summary, as I mentioned in round one, the 23 applications that have already gone to damage assessment with us estimating the cost at $190,000 each. And again, 17 of those applications are in the elderly priority group. That total comes to $4,370,000. In round two, um, there are 18 applications estimated at $190,000 each, that total comes to $3,420,000. So if you look, um, if you recall from the earlier frame, we talked about the uh, remaining funding of the 7.8 million. If you deduct what applicants are in round one and round two and the estimated cost, once they're all served, that will leave, leave a remaining amount of $90,972,000. Next. Gloria, before you move on, or yes, I'm sorry, you, you might, well, you might be getting to it, but um, I guess from the folks that are, have applications in, do we know how many we're not gonna be able to fund? Um, yes. Um, we do, I'm sure we do, and I may have to defer to uh, Sue with ICF for that number, because we've had so many numbers, because there are quite a few people um, in, in the uh, eligibility stage. However, what we did with the methodology is, again, as you, and I'm sure that's why you're asking Councilwoman Devine, is based on the metho methodology, we know who we're going to be able to serve. We're, you wanted to know the total number of those that we're not going to be able to serve, correct? Correct. Okay. So, um, Gloria, if I may jump in, this is Dolores Recurso. Yes. So, Dolores. there is a group of folks, um, there are about 55 applicants who only have one priority. Uh, and those folks, most likely, we will not get to. And then there, and there's about 54 folks in that group. And then another, uh, 16 to 17 folks who have no priority at all. However, that being said, remember that these numbers are based on 190,000. So um, if the cost is actually less, less, we will continue to move folks up and through the process as funding becomes available. Okay, so we can't really say hey, there's 70-some uh, folks that may not get help. Those folks may get help because we don't spend the 190 and we end up spending it when all is said and done and Rick does his calculation, the average is maybe 90,000, then we're looking at being able to increase the total number of folks that we're helping. And we're, we're, we'll tr we're tracking the funding as well as what's left and continue to move folks forward. We work together as a team so that we can get folks through the process as quickly as possible. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you, Dolores. Okay. Thank you, Dolores. No so, um, so next time. Gloria. Yes, sir. Let me ask this question. 
and I know it may be a question that uh, we may not just want to do that. How doable it is for us to be provided with a list of those persons in round one and two? Meaning you want to know where they live and that's the names and where they live? I mean, it could be an address or a name or whatever. Um, I think in order to in order to disseminate the information in a very accurate way, finding out and knowing who those persons are, we could possibly help with some PR in terms of their own frustration. Um, Ms. Wilson, I'll defer to you um, on that in terms of providing that detailed information. Well, I mean, that, well, you can defer to me. I think that's ultimately going to be a legal question, Reverend McDowell, as to how much information we can provide. Um, yes, ma'am. There, I've seen a list. I've never, I've seen the list with applicant numbers. And I think um, Dolores, the yeah. list that we utilize, you all had scrubbed it originally on the tables and it may have shown, showed as much as you could show so, publicly. So I don't, you know, I, I, we can talk to you, Reverend Dow, about that and try to work with you with your particular questions and constituents. I don't know that sure. we need to just, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that we can just blanketly give out all the information about every applicant. Yeah, I would not, I would not want that. Perhaps there are other persons in one or two of the other districts and other folk who have situations uh, sort of similar to what I'm experiencing and with the client, with the uh, constituent. Yes, um, sir. So if there's an individual conversation, uh, I'd certainly welcome that. Yes, And I'm sir. not saying that carte blanche, we take a list and put all that. No, I'm not asking for that. Just specifically in those areas that affect the constituents where I serve. Yes, sir. Dolores, did you want to add to that? Yeah, so just a couple of things. Um, with federal dollars come baggage, as we all know, and there are certain rules and regulations. So uh, personal identifiable information is protected. So we, we can't just, we cannot give out information unless you are the applicant. We can we could speak in general terms, but not specific information, unless you are the applicant or the applicant's designated uh, contact person. And so um, I think, and I don't know, and I know Gloria is going to get to it um, in the last slide, but we ICF, we do um, receive phone calls every day. Uh, Candy Anderson, who is our person in charge of applicant and constituent services, does a wonderful job of walking and working through the applicants that call and have concerns of where they are in the process and we'll sit there and spend however time, however much time we have to um, talking to them. We uh, have in place that we will return their calls uh, in, in, within the 24 hours and we give them as much information as we can as to what their status is. Um, so I would encourage uh, you all to make sure you have that number and that you share that with your constituents. And if any of you would like to call Candy directly and kind of have a general uh, conversation with her about some something, you, an individual you have concerns about, then we can reach out to the individual. That's what is part of our job and that's what we do on a regular basis. Well, I think, you, I think you all know that when folk can't get in touch with you guys, they're going to call us. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a given. So to have that kind of conversation individually, and I understand, I understand uh, Fed raids and all of that sort of thing, but I also understand when folk are hurting and they can't get the information that they need and want they're going to reach out to one of us. Yes, sir. Well, I'll work, we'll work with you, Reverend McDowell, on that, of course. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. 
Okay, right. next. So next steps moving forward. Um, so as we've talked about, we've shown you how we prioritized <clears throat> uh, the, the entire uh, the application pool. And we've shown you the applications uh, that have been moved or will be moved to damage assessments as funded, funding becomes available. Um, and the following slides will present the next grouping to consider as funding becomes available. And so we are ready to move forward and excited about what's ahead. So in the next frame here we have, so we've already talked about round one and two. So in this particular group, we're looking at 35 applicants. Out of this group, 31 of the applicants are elderly and four uh, have either have uh, four um, priorities. So what we're doing here is we're showing you out of those um, that in order to serve the 35 in this group at $190,000 each, it will cost an additional $6,650,000. So if we can go to the next frame. Um, here, because we know what it would cost to serve 35, we want to go over with you some of the recommendations um, that through the leadership of Ms. Wilson that staff has looked at um, that could, be, could potentially be used to assist additional applications. And so we are, are proposing potential uh, additional fundings, funding in community development block grant, re revolving loan fund dollars in the amount of $570,771. We're proposing $1 million from the Home Investment Partnership Grant Fund. And also we're proposing um, from the ARP fund a million dollars. But I will point out um, as a point of reference that with ARP, the funds are subject to treasury guidance. So this is, this is a proposal of how we can come up with additional dollars to assist uh, additional applicants. And so based on that amount, you're looking at potentially 14 additional applicants that could be served and that would allow for a, a surplus of $1,743 left over which can't do a whole lot with that, but at the end of the day, we wanna spend as much money as we can so you don't want a lot left over. Um, so the next frame, please. So we're summarizing everything here. We talked about the 90,772,000 that will be left over from the first two cohorts of line, um, uh, round one and round two, plus the proposed funding from CDBG RLF from home and from ARP. That gives a total of 2,661,743. Less uh, the round three ap applications where we say we can serve 14 additional applications if we're able to uh, you know, solidify those funds. Um, that total again is 2,660, which again would leave the $1,743 in surplus funds. So next. All right, so that's the end. Um, I hope that information was useful to you. And then, you know, again, we're available if you have any other questions at this time to answer to answer your questions as best we can. Can you go back one slide, please, Gloria? And, yes, ma'am. Okay, so the funding summary here again, these are just recommended um, potential funding sources. Obviously, um, you all are fairly familiar, familiar with our revolving loan fund through CDBG and the home program. Um, we, we tried not to de deplete the home program funds, correct, Gloria, with the recommendation here? Yes, ma'am. And then with the RLF, I think that probably is the majority of it, correct? Correct. Okay. But I do think to be able to potentially assist 14 more applicants out of the 35 remaining would be a good use of the funds. And obviously, uh, assuming that the criteria would be met through the ARP funding, um, that, that would also be a wise use of those funds. So those are recommendations as we continue to move forward. 
and we can bring those um, back to you to confirm if you want us to move in that direction as we first and foremost get through rounds one and two as, as they were explained to you. All right. Any questions? Questions, any additional questions? All right. Thanks, and thanks Teresa for um, um, uh, reflecting the, uh, the constant um, feedback and, and, and frustrations uh, of council and acting on it. Appreciate the leadership. Yes, sir, Mayor. So I know Gloria and the team have some additional presentations as well today, Gloria. Yes, ma'am. So this is, I've finished my part and um, our uh, Dolly Bristow, our CD administrator has two additional presentations uh, that she will be doing. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you to the SBP and ICF team members as well. Thank you, Gloria. Good afternoon. Hi, Hi. Good afternoon to Mayor and uh, City Council and to Ms. Wilson. Um, while they're uploading the uh, presentation here, just want to take this time uh, to say it's very good to see all of you. A lot of times we don't get the opportunity to, to see you on a regular basis. So it's good to know uh, that you're all still um, participating in, and doing well, uh, and, and that is a blessing. So I'm here uh, this afternoon just to give you a brief presentation on the um, CARES Act Round 3 Substantial Amendment to the uh, Consolidated Plan, the 2024 Consolidated Plan, and the 2020 Annual Action Plan. On September 11th, 2020, um, HUD made available some uh, remaining dollars of the uh, CDBG CV allocations to the entitlements. And um, they named this round three. And this allocation um, really is, is, is for uh, fighting the spread of COVID-19 uh, by providing assistance to renters and homeowners. The amount that the city of Columbia was awarded in round three was $976,268. And of course, we also received uh, round one funding at 611,921 for a total in community development block grant funding uh, of one point, a little over 1.5 million. Uh, in addition, in round one, the city also received 220,838 in HOPWA funding. And these funds are to be used to address uh, the coronavirus, um, to prevent, prepare, or respond to uh, the pandemic. Next slide. So the provisions under uh, CDBG CV, uh, it, it does suspend the 15% public service cap. It also um, has a five day public comment period. Normally our comment period is 30 days. So this is uh, a provision that has shortened that comment period. Also suspends in-person public meetings and um, gives us the option to hold them virtually as we're doing today. Uh, in addition to that, um, these funds, CB funds are not included in the timeliness um, requirement that HUD has at 24 CFR 570.902. So it, it, these funds do not count toward our timeliness test. Um, also, there are other waivers that HUD has, but these waivers um, there are waivers that are not included, which are fair housing, non-discrimination, labor standards, and environmental reviews. Five-year priority goals and, um, that were established in our five-year action plan, or five-year, excuse me, uh, consolidated plan, uh, the 
these CV funds um, directly impact the public service and quality of life improvements, uh, specifically the goal 3B, the vital services for LMI households. Um, and so all of our priorities um, are listed here, but the CV funds specifically for the uh, round three will impact um, the goal 3B, uh, 3B. Next slide. So our proposed projects um, for the CDBG CV funding, um, the projects are um, administration at 195,000, a little over 195,000, and public services, which includes the activities um, that will address LMI, individuals, households, um, or neighborhoods, um, and that activity being rental or mortgage assistance that will assist up to six months in um, rental or mortgage in, that are in arrears, and also utility assistance up to two months, but it does not include water as the utility. The total cost, uh, the, the total 976,268. We've come to this conclusion that um, using these federal dollars for uh, public services that will address rental and mortgage. Uh, there was a survey, we did do a survey uh, that was available um, between April 13th and April 19th that really targeted the nonprofit agencies and the community-based organizations. As you remember, when CB funds first were available, um, we did a survey at that time uh, to see what the needs were to, for the community. But because needs have changed and we are at a different point, we wanted to in, be inclusive to those agency, agencies that serve um, our, our citizens. And what they found was the greatest need uh, for their clients being housing assistance. Um, and, uh, and of course, that's, we, we all know that, you know, that is a, a major priority right now at 41, um, 0.18%. And of course, there were some other uh, needs, but housing assistance being the greatest. And then when we asked what the client's uh, immediate needs were, 76.47% said, said housing assistance. And then what does your organization deem the greatest need for your clients due to the impacts of COVID-19? 82% um, was rental assistance with 17% being um, utility assistance. And so with that um, information, we were able to uh, proceed um, with ensuring that these funds would be used for um, housing assistance. So, the substantial amendment timeline, time and, and like I said, this is a very brief presentation. Um, the public comment period for CV3 um, was April 13th through the 19th. Um, City Council presentation, which we are doing today. Uh, this information will be submitted, the substantial amendment will be submitted to HUD by May 27th. And then, um, HUD may take up to 45 days uh, to review and approve, which means these funds would be available um, around July 13th. So that's just a, a brief timeline, just to give you an indication of, of the process that uh, we need to do. Any questions, we will still, um, the, the community uh, citizens are still able to provide comments if they'd like, and we will make sure that they are included in, in our uh, submission for the substantial amendment. And they can do that um, online or they can uh, do it via post mail to community development at 1401 Main Street or 
um, they can send any additional comments directly to community development at community development at columbiasc.gov. In addition to that, um, we wanna make sure that we get comments by um, May 13th. Dollar. Yes, may sir. Ask, may I ask a question, Ed McDowell? And I know this may be far-fetched as we um, talk about the substantial amendment. But look, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost like a scratch record because I'm very interested and concerned about our fire, fire fighters and the equipment there. And I know that there is some specificity in terms of what, what's outlined in the uh, substantial amendment. But is there any way, any way we could possibly look at some options in terms of helping our firefighters with uh, equipment? And when I say equipment, I'm talking about a change. I mean, again, the cancer rate for firefighters, it's not decreasing, but increasing. Is there a possibility are there some, is there another way either to the left or to the right where some of our firefighters could be given another change of uh, equipment? Oh, we're using the CARES Act money for that. So we can? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, can but this is different. All right, I know that. I know that I just want to say again, just in case, probably. We got some substantial, substantial amendment monies out there and we don't know what to do with it. We got a place for it to fall. Well, I, I can say that for um, the project that we have this money classified under as public service. Now, I'm not sure what type of uh, equipment that you are referring, is it which, personal? Which, personal yeah, equipment which, or is it equipment for a fire station or? It's, it's equipment for firefight. It's their, their second, uni not uniform. Their second what? set of gear, Reverend Mendel. I'm sorry? A second set of gear. Yeah, second set of gear. I'm sorry. Yes. So, yes, it's put, it could very well be classified public service because these firefighters need a second set of gear. So, whatever, whatever, whatever whatever uh, pot it falls in, I wanna make sure we keep this at the forefront of these guys who are giving service to this city and to this, to uh, every event that takes place that they are risking their lives. Well, it's, it's certainly something, um, you know, we, we can look into more clearly. Um, I can't say that it will be eligible today, but we'll certainly look um, into the possibility uh, of that. And again, it would need to be classified under public service, sure. uh, which is, is what this pot of money is for. Um, and so that, that's certainly something we can look into um, prior I'd to submission. I'd really appreciate that. I have not talked to Chief uh, about this recently, but it's a concern of mine because of the attention that was given when I visited a fire station. So yes, if you'd look into that and of course see whether or not there are some available monies under the substantial amendment that we could possibly use for a second set of gear for these guys and women. There's $6 million CARES Act money that the city has from the stimulus that we could we could designate if we make it a priority. Good. All right. Whatever pot it, whatever pot it falls in, I think yeah. these guys are deserving to get it. That's an understatement, Ed. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Dolly right now? So Dolly, so people who who are who are um, looking forward to this, uh, the the best way for them to provide comments is is by email, uh, and they got to do it before midnight on 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 the uh, 13th right that is correct sir okay 
Any other questions? And I'm sorry, I can't see everyone with the screen up, uh, with their hands up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mayor Benjamin, I'm sorry, I'm doing a little bit of multitasking, um, just because I know some of you all are concerned about the uh, recent shooting we're hearing, not confirmed in five points, um, Mr. Brennan. I'm trying to get his factual information for you. So Chief and Deputy Chief are sending that um, as soon I've as- I've gotten three texts about it. So anything you can let us know be- Yes, there. sir. I'm trying right, right now. Um, the officers are on the scene in between Andy's Deli and apartments. The possible suspect and victim fled together. Canines are tracking down there. That's all I'm, I've got right now. I think they do have a, some other information that I can't get into, but they're um, working on it. Worth, worth noting that it's contemporaneous with a, a summary dismissal of our uh, three ordinance. Uh, lawsuit by the Attorney General. Uh, the reality is that we need to do everything we can to keep guns out of the hands of, of, of folks who want to do harm to each other. And uh, and as I, I didn't share my comment with all of you, I, I think I did send it to the city manager. I, I find it um, wholly offensive uh, that uh, the people of Columbia didn't have the opportunity to make its arguments uh, before the judge. This is important enough that even Senator Graham has spoken on red flag laws and that the President of the United States has spoken uh, quite often just in the last couple of weeks about red flag laws um, and ghost guns in particular. Um, uh, these laws, these ordinances passed by this council are consistent uh, with the Second Amendment, consistent with uh, state uh, laws uh, and the opportunity to just argue those on behalf of the people uh, of the city. Um, uh, has been denied to us. Uh, we will fall, file a motion for reconsideration. Uh, if in fact uh, uh, that is not offered, then we'll appeal the decision. Uh, but um, if, if this council is willing to work, the President of the United States is willing to work, and the Grams willing to work, then our judges need to work too. I and you know, Mr. Mayor, thank you for continuing to push that fight. It is important. It is kind of you know disappointing once again that you know. The judicial system is, is really affecting our ability to protect our citizens. And I think police officers are tired of repeat offenders and, and folks continuing to be let off. And, and now we don't have the ability to work with, and I agree with you 100%. We, we were in the right and we should have that opportunity to be heard. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, we got one more presentation, Madam City Manager. You're on mute, Teresa. My apologies. Yes, sir. Dolly, are you taking through us through the final presentation? I certainly am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And this is our fiscal year 2021 annual action plan for community development at Mayor and Council. Yes. So this, um, I'm presenting the 2021 annual action plan, um, which represents the second year of the city's consolidated plan uh, for the fiscal years 20 through 2024. Um, this was ratified by city council and approved uh, by HUD, and that was the, the five-year plan. So the annual action plan um, really is submitted every year and um, it addresses the priorities um, that have been identified uh, through the con plan. And it also uh, describes specific uses or planned uses um, for uh, HUD dollars for um, activities. And it helps us determine what we are going to utilize to reach our program priorities and goals. And this information is managed through HUD's Integrated Disbursement Information System or IDIS. And so that's where we house all of the program and um, re recorded information. So the 21, uh, 2021 um, funding allocation, the three Entitlements that we uh, represent under this plan are CDBG, 
Community Development Block Grant, Home, and COPWA, Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. For our allocation for 2021, we received a little over a million dollars in CDBG, along with um, other program um, income and the revolving loan fund, as well as some prior year uh, funding. Um, we would have a total re revenue of a little over $1.8 million uh, for our budget for 2021 for CDBG. For the Home Investment Partnership, our allocation is 690,000 um, added with the program income to a total revenue uh, that would be available at $940,000. Um, and for HOPWA, uh, our allocation a little over 1.5 million uh, coupled with some prior year funding for a total revenue of $1.6 million or $1,609,215. Total revenue uh, estimated for the 2021, excuse me, for the 21 fiscal year is $4,417,813. Of course, other funding sources that community development administers, you've heard about the disaster recovery dollars. There's also the, the CDBG mitigation program dollars. Um, and um, I just presented on the uh, CARES Act funding dollars, um, which total um, altogether uh, for CARES Act is uh, a little over $1.8 million for the CARES Act. All of these are, are managed under community development. And again, our priority goals and needs, which we addressed in the last presentation. Um, um, and so all of the activities that we recommend for funding go through a vetting process uh, through the, the Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, and one of their goals and their focuses is making sure that the activities that are selected will help us meet these priorities um, our priorities and the goals that we have set uh, for the uh, five-year strategic plan. The focused redevelopment areas, um, City Council uh, did determine the four prioritized redevelopment areas, um, which are Booker Washington Heights, um, King Lion Street, Farrell Road Business Corridor, which is a part of the Eau Claire redevelopment area, and Edisto Court um, redevelopment area. And, and we are continuing um, to utilize these as the prioritized areas. However, there are uh, a total of seven um, redevelopment areas, which also include Belvedere redevelopment area, Brandon Acres, Cedar Terrace, um, and the NRSA redevelopment. So 95% of our um, projected uh, expenditures for the 2021 fiscal year uh, will be um, utilized for those that will those that are low moderate income uh, or neighborhoods or areas, and then this will meet our uh, public benefit uh, requirement of 70%. So we have to have at least 70% of our expenditures uh, in our program year um, must be for those that are LMI. And just to reiterate what LMI is, of course, it's 80% um, um, or less of the area median income. And as of the 2021 um, income HUD income limits, uh, a family of four um, at 80% is $5,700. Uh, and um, we talked about in some of the other presentations about what is extremely low, the 30%, the extremely low. So this, uh, you see a household of four um, would be 26,500. So that's extremely low. Um, so just wanted to highlight for you. 
on that. Next slide. So the planned activities uh, that we have, uh, these are being recommended. And again, these have gone through um, the uh, NOPA process or our notification of funds available process, which uh, ultimately gets vetted through our citizens advisory committee. And we are recommending um, the activities under CDBG, um, the, the three pro project areas are administration, public services, and um, non-public service or public facilities, infrastructure, and demolition. For public services, um, there's a, a total of 177,150 um, through various activities, including those applicants that were awarded um, through the vetting process, the comment uh, for their um, comment to the market pilot program, um, Mercy, United Way of the Midlands, Homeless No More, Fast Forward, and Community Development, uh, the Bank on Financial Literacy uh, Program. Under the public facilities, uh, infrastructure and demolition projects, uh, city departments were awarded these dollars for public works, um, for the, the Booker Washington Street uh, replacement and improvement, the police department, uh, the demolition project, parks and recreation, uh, the TS Martin renovation phase two, and uh, the Office of Business Opportunity to continue the good work they do with the commercial revitalization and retention program. That total for uh, the public facilities and non-public service um, activities is $872,767. And then last, our, our housing programs, um, which community development administers uh, through our department. Uh, there's the administration and operations of our housing uh, portfolio, the housing uh, maintenance assistance program or MAP, and then City Lender One um, loan program or uplift. And so that total is 560,000 total of the budget is 1,868,590 uh, for the CDBG budget. Moving on to home, home has an allocation um, for administration for um, the Choto set aside, which is the community housing development organization. Um, it's required that we set aside 15% of our entitlement uh, to assist those um, organizations that promote and move forward affordable housing. And also um, the majority of our budget is being set aside or used for residential affordable uh, loans, acquisition, rehabilitation, or new construction. And so those are the three categories or project areas uh, for the home dollars for a total of $940,008. And then the action plan activities for HAPWA program, our sponsors, um, the Columbia Housing Authority, the Midlands Housing Alliance for Transitions, Palmetto AIDS Life Support Services, the Cooperative Ministry, Upper Savannah Care Services, and the University of South Carolina. Uh, they are our sponsors who provide direct benefits or direct services uh, to the individuals that um, are HIV or AIDS positive and are LMI. The total budget for uh, our sponsors
So our next steps, of course, um, we have had, uh, we are currently in our public comment period. Um, the public comment period began April 10th and will end May 11th. Uh, we have had our first public hearing. The hearing today is our second public hearing. Um, and also we are requesting approval to move our draft um, annual action plan to be able to submit it to HUD uh, no later than May 13th. And our program year then will begin July 1st, 2021. Are there any questions? Well, yeah, I, I, I review um, uh, all the annual reports and uh, really appreciate the work that you all do and, and that our citizens committees uh, uh, committee does as well. Have we ever produced in the in the aggregate that this may be going over the last 10 years or 15 or 20 years, um, all the investments in, in affordable housing, whether it be rental, uh, low income, uh, 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 for sale, fee simple ownership, or even the projects uh, like Lauric Place and, and the point at Elmwood that we've helped um, leverage dollars to, to get done. It, it, is, it, is that something we could produce, uh, Teresa and, and Dolly? I think it'd be worth showing um, uh, exactly how much we, we've devoted in that space. I think it, it, might, it might actually be uh, not just insightful, but um, um, uh, rewarding to, to all the discussions around affordable housing. Shall we call it the Benjamin Legacy Report? <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said 20 years. You, 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 oh, you, okay. You, this goes well, well beyond me, but but it, it will be important to note, um, uh, uh, Tamika mentioned earlier, the. Um, uh, I work particularly um, around the, uh, the home ownership piece is something that um, people still, I mean, it amazes me, it's still not a novel idea uh, when, I, when I share it with colleagues across the country. But 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 those two projects alone, I mean, and obviously we, we, we talk about the point at Elmwood and the partnership with Second Nazareth and, and what, what, it, what it's meant uh, to the, it's the, that entire community. We've had ongoing community discussions about about that particular area, and and just over the over the course of time, looking at Daniel and and and, and Sam and and and, and Tamika, uh, we've invested significant resources uh, to go back to uh, EW and Luther and, and Bob and Ann and everybody else. Uh, but but unless you've actually seen what was what was there before, uh, it, it's tough to kind of understand that. Uh, but Lark Lar Lar Place just jumps out to me because I remember us leaving. City Council meeting late one night, right. uh, head, head, mm -hmm. heading up, heading over there because of of, of, of the of the, uh, the the chief raising the red flag on on the, on the uh, fire conditions right. and the faulty wiring there, and a number of people, a uh, number of whom were um, uh, were non English speaking uh, residents uh, mm -hmm. uh, there who who were being frankly taken advantage of, and then you think about the way in which uh, we methodically uh, leverage these partnerships. Uh, to, to produce high quality uh, low income housing in that in that space, tear, tore down what was old and built up what was new in, in District Two. I just think we got to do a better job telling the story. Uh, there, there's been there's been a significant amount done, and and unless unless you you, you tell the story and, and then realize how much more we can do, um, um, uh, uh, recognizing the need is still uh, great and grave. But uh, I, I would I'd like to see uh, a report of, of what we've been able to do in the aggregate, and that, quite frankly, may, may very well be looking at the um, um, the, the, the various uh, reports and, and, and totaling them up. I mean, guys, we stepped up with the MAP program, we stepped up with the PEAR program, the GAP program, um, um, specific design, spending millions of dollars on on, on, on weatherizing homes, and, and not only focusing on homeowners, but also focusing on on, on landlords. And making sure that they have the resources for those who, who might uh, be focusing on on rental um, uh, a rental situation as opposed to a home ownership situation. But we've done a lot. Uh, I mean, our our our, our team has done a, a, a lot over multiple administrations and and through several um, uh, uh, staff leads, uh, uh, Gloria and Deborah and Tony and and, and everyone else. So uh, to, uh, you know, I mean, it's just. It's worth being able to tell the story. I'd like to see that in, in the aggregate and go well beyond uh, me coming to the city. I'm, I'm talking about looking over a 20 year horizon and just being able to tell what we've done and be able to clearly uh, articulate that. And I haven't thought about what the county or the state others might do because uh, 
Yeah, just it'd be it'd be okay. worth seeing these numbers because these numbers are, are good numbers. Uh, we leverage federal dollars very well. We leverage private sector dollars uh, fairly well. There's a new opportunity, obviously, with the new state low-income housing uh, uh, tax credit complementing the federal uh, dollars. Uh, we we good. but it's very difficult to kind of know where you're going unless you can clearly articulate where you come from. And and you know this this process is. You gotta be innovative. You gotta ideate, but you but 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 it's it's iterative. You know, we we learned some things along the way that that have worked, and some that haven't worked. And I think uh, it's it's worth putting all that in in, in one place, in one document. So uh, that's a, that's the request, Teresa and, and Dolly and Gloria. Let's pull that together. Absolutely, certainly. Thank you. Any uh, any other questions for um uh, from the council before we? I think this is a, a public hearing. Uh, and, and I'd ask uh, uh, Ms. Grajales if uh, if we have any citizens who who've, uh, who signed up to speak who may want to have their voice heard on the uh, FY 2021 Annual Action Plan for Community Development. Anything, lady? Uh, no, Mayor, nobody has indicated that they wish to speak. Um, anybody that's currently hearing, if you would like to speak on this item, you can press star three to raise your hand and um, we will connect it to the meeting. But for right now, uh, nobody appears to um, be on the line to speak on this item. And for those clearly um, monitoring my, my, my um, speech, uh, Ms. Grahalis' first name is Lady. Uh, so, uh, so. That's why I said anything else, lady. Uh, but um, <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, lady. Any, uh, any, uh, any other questions from council for, for, for Ms. Brista? All right, good deal. And, and Mayor Benjamin, I do think that Dolly or Gloria can correct me if I'm wrong that they would like a vote in order to go ahead and submit to HUD, um, notwithstanding any additional public input they receive. That is correct, Teresa. Thank you. I so move, Mr. Mayor. A second. Second. For our discussion, move the previous question for call the roll. Mr. Brennan. Yes. Mr. Rickman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Uh, Mr. McDowell. Ed, you got yes. the vote. Mr. Duval. Um, Aye. Ms. Devine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Let the record reflect Mr. McDowell put his thumb up. Uh, you 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 all mute now. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good deal. Good deal. Very all good. All right. Aye. Mr. Good. Mayor, we can move into the consent agenda items seven through thirteen. All right. We'll move. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, done. We'll move the previous question. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Ms. Devine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Thank you, ma'am. Event resolutions, items 14 through 20. Item 14 is a resolution number R-2021-022, authorizing consumption of beer and wine only at Outfest Columbia in the 1200 block of Park Street between Gervais Street and Lady Street on Saturday, June 5th, 2021. And Mayor Benjamin and Council, I would add that we are still um, adhering to COVID-19 protocols, encouraging event planners to, to do that. And we've reviewed those um, prior to putting these resolutions on your agenda. That's also a wonderful um, opportunity, Teresa, as we look at the potential expiration of the mask ordinance, what those protocols will look like uh, going forward. Maybe feedback from y'all at, at the appropriate time as to how uh, that might modify things uh, in terms of spacing and attendance in, in the hallway. So just kind of keep that in mind. But thank you. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Is, it, is there 
is there a projected number attendance wise? Um, I don't let me look in your backup materials. I don't know if Sherry Artis or anyone is online, Teresa, that can find it maybe quicker than I can. I don't know that we have those numbers for each of them. You know, they're like I said last time, Reverend McDowell, sometimes they're able to give us that, but you know, quite frankly, these events are open to the public. So it's, I mean, it would be a, a guesstimate at best. Is that a part of the protocol when they fill out the application for an event? I think that our staff, you know, public safety staff tries to get some ind indication whether or not it's a hard and fast number, probably not. Well, I don't have any problem with the event. My only problem, of course, it is they're open for the public. Uh, our we will renew our mass ordinance at some point. Um, do they have the necessary CDC guidelines attached to the protocol? Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Move for approval. Second. Any discussion? All right. Um, any discussion with the previous question, Kirk Carborough? Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Yes. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Ms. Devine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you. Item 15 is resolution number R2021028 only at the Juneteenth Fest on Saturday, June 19th, 2021. All right. uh, is there a motion? Move for approval. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? We'll move the previous question. Part call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Ms. Devine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you. Item 16, resolution number R2021030, authorizing consumption of beer and wine only at Ladies Who Lunch on Saturday, May 22nd, 2021. Move. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll move the previous question. Card call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Ms. Devine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 17, resolution number R2021031, authorizing consumption of beer and wine only at the Columbia Food and Wine Festival in the 1600 block of Blanding Street on Sunday, May 23rd, 2021. A motion. Motion to approve. Aye. Second. Aye. Second. Aye, Mr. McDowell. Same question. Same question. Same question. How many people? And, and we, are we following CDC protocols? Yes, yes, sir. Well, for me, for the let, I will, will not ask the question again. Are all the events CDC protocol? Yes, sir. I mean, we we ask them to do that. Yes, sir. Okay. I hope we I hope we can be sober with all these drinking events taking place. <laughs> Yes, different days, eh? Yeah, but well, you get drunk different days too. <laughs> yeah, move, we can move the previous question. <laughs> but call uh, Mr. Brennan. Yes. Mr. Rickman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. 
Aye. Ms. Devine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. This weather is something else right now, y'all. Yep. No hard. Please, Teresa. Yes, sir. Item 18, resolution number R2021-032, authorizing consumption of beer and wine beverages only at the Main Street Latin Festival in the 1300 and 1400 blocks of Main Street, the western half block of the 1200 block of Lady Street, the eastern half block of the 1100 block of Lady Street, and the eastern half block of the 1100 block of Washington Street on Saturday, August 28, 2021, for the rain date contingency of Saturday, September 4, 2021. All right. All right. Is that motion? Move approval. This is a public event, right? Yes, sir. The, uh, uh, this was moved and probably seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move the previous question. Clerk, call Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes, reluctantly. Okay. Mr. Tuval? Aye. I had shared Mr. Vine. that Aye. most people have listed a number of guests to Mr. The David? Aye. Guestimates because they don't sell tickets ahead of time. Mr. You're Benjamin? Your, 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 your uh, volume's on Teresa Knox. Right. <laughs> Mike's not out there. Aye, ma'am. Thank you. Let's keep on. So item 19, um, I'll speak to this one after I read it. Mayor Benjamin into the record. Resolution number R2021-035, authorizing <laughs> consumption of beer and wine only within Boyd Plaza adjacent to the Columbia Museum of Art for first Thursdays on Main on Thursdays, June 2021, July 1st, 2021, August 5th, 2021, September 2nd, October 7th, November 4th, and December 2nd, 2021. And with this event, Mayor and Council, I did speak with the event organizer, and just for your information, if you recall, um, first Thursdays have been going on since probably around 2014. Obviously, our main street has grown and changed from now to then, and um, the event organizers certainly are requesting to um, be able to partake in beer and wine up and down Main Street during the event. This year, we uh, did not approve that, but did approve for them to be in uh, Boyd Plaza, very similar to how we handle um, the beer and wine on the time, the, the opportunities that that's allowed during Soda City or other events. And so I, I spoke with them. They were very understanding about um, not just really because of the, the mask ordinance and the COVID protocols, but this was more about um, public safety concerns um, that PD, CPD has now with that movement up and down the street and um, intersections not being blocked and people crossing. So I just wanted to make that clarification for you that this change was more about public safety. Um, we did entertain that we would review it again and with the potential of the 1500 block of Main Street being utilized for that purpose, but um, they were fine with us um, beginning the event in June um, as you are approving it. Combined to Boyd Plaza. A motion? I move mean, approval. Approved and second. Any further discussion? Yeah, first Thursdays is one of the very first things we get on. It, it, it was before 2013, 2014, in a more informal way. Mm -hmm. um, um, so um, yeah, continue to work with them, and uh, and obviously, you know, we 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 can get kind of um, put loose and fancy free sometimes. It, it it helps to have Chief Holbrook and folks like Derek Thornton and others kind of keep their eyes on on the. The movement of people, uh, particularly when, when alcohol is involved. So, thank you uh, for staying on top of that. Uh, we'll move the previous question, Kurt Caldwell. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duall? Aye. 
Ms. Devine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye, thank you. Mm -hmm. And our one. final event resolution is over 2021-036, authorizing consumption of beer and wine beverages only at the South Carolina Park on the 1800 block of Main Street between Laurel Street and Richland Street on Saturday, June 12, 2021, with a rain contingency date of Sunday, July 18th, 2021. No motion. So move. A second. Second. Question. Seeing none, we'll move the previous question on Clerk Call Roll. Mr. Bremen? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Ms. Devine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. And thank you so much, uh, Lady uh, Theresa. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sorry, Mr. McDowell. Uh, just for the record, uh, I'd just like to state a uh, point of personal privilege. I hope the approving of all these events doesn't give anyone the notion of false normalcy. As you know, this thing and the numbers could very well change rather quickly. Um, I exercise, and of course, I continue to exercise. Uh, an extreme amount of cautiousness. Um, I did that, I voted yes on all of them today, but I think we don't want to give anyone because the events are numerous and they're going to get, they're probably going to become more volumes in their requested events. Um, I think we need to hold fast with our ordinance, uh, mass ordinance, uh, I just don't want us to, to give folk a false sense of normalcy that this virus is still present, the numbers are lower, um, and that every protocol has got to be exercised. Thank you, sir. Uh, absolutely, uh, Ms. McDowell. And with the, uh, with the resolutions done, uh, Ms. Wilson, let, let's, um, I think the, the, the process used to, to a review and make sure we have um, certain protocols in place before these events. I know, I know we, we constantly update them based on CDC uh, guidance. I'm sure they will be. Uh, share that with, uh, with, with with council, kind of just what the checklist is. Um, obviously, let's let's update them according to CDC guidance. And I, I would ask uh, us as we step into it is decidedly another thing here. Uh, let any ideas that we have. Um, for, for, for staff and, and particularly um, uh, Chief Tinsley and Chief Holbrook and Chief Jenkins and others who've been playing a key role in, in helping us um, uh, manage this. Uh, but, but for uh, Ms. Wilson in particular, any ideas we have as to how we might creatively deal with, um, uh, deal with the uh, ongoing pandemic uh, that much more creatively, send her those ideas and send them to her uh, soon. You know, my, 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 as I'm, I'm gonna continue talking about vaccine access and pushing uh, vaccine access and as many creative, creative goals as we can. And just as we spend so much time talking about reaching that 5% uh, infection rate, getting uh, seeing our, our, our cases decelerate to a point that, that, that there was a, a low spread and use as a guide very much early on in the pandemic when, when, when 5% appeared to be a pipe dream. Uh, and we're finally here let's set new goals, um, uh, aspirational goals, mm -hmm. goals and, and maybe those goals can be around uh, the role that we play in partnership with everyone else on, on getting people, getting shots in arms uh, and, and really creatively uh, make, making that happen. So uh, we all have ideas. Um, I've heard from everyone really good ideas. Let's, let's figure out how we can get that much more creative in, in, in uh, getting uh, over the hurdle of vaccine hesitancy and, and getting folks uh, um, uh, to a position where, where, where they're safer. Um, uh, Mr. Rickman? I just was gonna say, Mr. Mayor, what you mentioned earlier about getting to the folks, and we've had some areas that consistently had struggles and numbers and I, I, I support, and I think we should, as a council, at the end of this meeting, um, take a vote to move forward and put into motion a way to get those vaccines 
Um, you know, if it's the Johnson and Johnson where it's a one, one hit wonder, or if it's, um, you know, Moderna or the Pfizer, get it to those folks. I think, you know, there are plenty of nurses that we could hire. We could work with our clinic, but whatever, I think your idea is spot on. And I think we ought to get it out to those folks and make sure that they take advantage of it, um, for their well being. I hope we can move that yeah. forward. That's a really good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we, yeah, we all got them. Let's, 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 set, let's, let's just get them uh, all of them in one place on one sheet of paper, uh, so we, we can figure out kind of what our what our role is. Because a lot a lot of these things, I the resources are there via DHEC or Prisma, Eau Claire Cooperative, or, or uh, Ed's been working with you know with Providence. You know, I mean, there, there's there's so much out there. Uh, but you know, even even very early on in the pandemic, you know, we 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 played a key leadership and coordinating messaging role. I mean, uh, uh, the whole the whole team that Teresa would, would stand up for floods and, and hurricanes <laughs> turned into a COVID response team and, and, and Harry and, and everyone's been doing great work. Now we have resources, uh, more resources than we've ever had to deal with with this type of, a, of, of an issue. That's how we can deploy them very aggressively and strategically to hit that 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 uh, 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 those those new goals that we that we articulate. So love to talk a little bit more. Mr. Mayor, I think you're absolutely right, and I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Breaking in, but I think we vaccinated over 2,000 folk, Providence, on a grassroots effort. And of course, it, become, it became very obvious to us that there were still a population within our city that had not been populated. What we are trying to do now is to reinvigorate that movement again to make sure that folk get that needle in their arm. And it's all grassroots. 2,000 folk over a um, very grass, grass rootage and um, folk bought into that. And we're going to start that program again through problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, Ms. Wilson, thank you. Thank you so much for the ordinances. Yes, sir. Ordinances first reading item 21, ordinance number 2021-021, amending the 1998 Code of Ordinances of the City of Columbia, South Carolina, Chapter 14, Offenses and Miscellaneous Provisions, Article 5, Offenses Involving Minors to Add Division 4, Conversion Therapy for Minors Prohibited. So move. Second. Um, move and second discussion. Uh, the previous question, Clerk Carl Roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Ms. Devine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. And Mayor Major Benjamin, sorry. <laughs> Aye. Item 22, ordinance number 2021-024, granting an encroachment to Columbia SC 63. Move. Second. Discussion? Move the previous question, Clerk Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. <clears throat> Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Ms. Devine? Aye. Mr. Davis, aye. Mayor Benjamin, aye. Guys, this is a this is another exciting one. Uh, uh, just uh, this combined with the wonderful coverage of the, of the murals uh, uh, this week in, in, in the state paper, uh, just articulating our commitment to telling the story um, of the African seed and American son in a way that's edifying and really lifts up the, the positive story of, of Columbia, including the real challenges uh, that, that we face. Uh, this this is another big move. So thank you all and congratulations. Item 23, ordinance number 2021-025, granting an encroachment to Brian and Sally McCants for the use of the right-of-way area of the 600 block of Wando Street for the installation and maintenance of a block retaining wall adjacent to 604 Wando Street. Is there a motion? Second. 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 Any discussion? With the previous question, Clerk Carterell. Mr. Brennan. Yes. 
Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Ms. Devine? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 24, I will read into the record, Mayor Benjamin and Council, then I'm going to ask our CFO and Assistant City Manager Jeff Palin to give a little more explanation for this item. Ordinance number 2021-040, amending the 1998 Code of Ordinances of the City of Columbia, South Carolina, Chapter 11, Licenses, Permits, and Miscellaneous Business Regulations, Article 2, Business and Professional Licenses, Section 1133, the purpose is the expiration of the license. Um, this is getting into the uniform business license um, that we are getting close to establishing here. Jeff? Sure. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Um, so item 24 on the agenda tonight, it's the first action awaiting council's approval as we begin to adopt the model ordinance as required by the South Carolina Business License Standardization Act 176. Act 176 requirements will provide for the uniformity of all business license rules throughout the state. This act takes effect on January 1, 2022. Tonight's ordinance will extend the current business license year to April 30, 2022 from our current expiration date of December 31st, 2021. And it will set all future business license years to run from May 1st through April 30. Staff anticipates that during a probably June, possibly July council meeting, the model ordinance and the new rate schedule will be on the agenda for approval. This will occur after we've completed our review of last year's collections and we've set the rates for next year so that we don't have a windfall in the revenue. MASC staff has been assisting city staff to accomplish this in July will be our really our final target date and that will be when we set up the online portal, which will allow all of our future business license renewals to be completed online. From August through December staff will work to notify customers of the changes. And that's all I have unless y'all have some questions on the process. And Jeff, the rationale behind that is COVID. Is that right? Um, no, sir. This is um, the state actually passed the Business License Standardization Act uh, this past year. So in general, every community has had uh, some general guidelines for their business license implementation, um, but different communities have done it a little differently. So it, it creates issues for a lot of our business license or I'm sorry, our business owners that have um, that are operating over multiple jurisdictions. So this kind of brings it together so that they kind of get looked at the same. It doesn't matter what city or county that they're in. And it also puts a, um, not only will the process be the same, but it also puts a rate classification system in place that they all kind of, I, I guess I'll say generically, they all get judged the same for what type of business they are, whether they're here or in Charleston or Horry County or up in Oconee County. Yeah. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes. Yeah, so the rate classification is uni I'm not universal, but it's collaborative. Okay, I got you. I it's, got yeah. you now. Long you time. Might, for the city of Columbia, you might want to know that this model was designed by Roy Bates, who is city attorney, and GC Robinette, who was a finance director for the city of, of Columbia. This this is their model that's been updated over the probably 35, 40 years yeah. that have uh, been used. I didn't know that, Howard. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Robinette, Robinette. Robinette was supposedly the he, the great hero. He <laughs> is the great hero. He's still out. He's still with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I heard. It's good. All right. All right. Uh, is there a motion? I'm sorry. Do they have a motion yet? Move. We'll move. move. Second. Um, move. Second. Discussion. We'll move the previous question. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Mr. Vine? Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Okay, item 25. Ordinance number 2021-039, authorizing the transfer of streets to the South Carolina Department of Transportation, identified as Gaston I, I move Street. approval of this. 
Yes, sir. Vote number 25. Is there a second? Second. Um, with a previous question, Clerk call up. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duval? Aye. Ms. Devine? Ms. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? An emphatic aye. This is a long time coming. Y'all keep <laughs> it. We've been waiting this one for a long time, so um, I'm excited about it. Uh, aye. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Resolutions, item 26, resolution number R-2021-049, authorizing acceptance and dedication of the street known as Candy Lane to the City of Columbia from Greystone Boulevard. Moved. And there a second? Second. Question, move the previous question, clerk call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Ms. Devine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Thank you. Resolution number R-2021-026, supporting the Housing Authority of the City of Columbia engaging in the Marion Street High-Rise Disposition Project. A motion. I, I move approval. So second. Move. second. Any discussion? With the previous question, Clark Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Yes, Duvall? Aye. Ms. Devine? Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. I, saw the, I did see the memo, Teresa, so all the issues around historic preservation will be addressed, right? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Item 28, resolution number R-2021-040, authorizing the city manager to execute a ground lease between the City of Columbia and Hampton Park Associates for the lease of 1427 Park Street and 1429 Park Street for the use motion. of a public parking lot. Thank you. Is there a motion? Move approval. A second. Second. Hey, this guy, y'all fading on me, man. Y'all are fading. <laughs> This rain is getting the best of you. I think that's what it is. I'm waiting uh, for Shanique to feed us. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, right. Those, those olden days. <laughs> Got to come back in the office with that one, baby. Our so, dear, huh? At least he, he, is, he, is, he, is liter, he is literally at home, yes. Uh, it's probably, at at, at least some chocolate. Of, a whole lot of food right there for him, but, but, uh, but you can't leave the camera. That's right. <laughs> It tells me a lot about Miss Allie Ann, though. Uh, she ended up with their well, at least <laughs> some chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> we got we got move the previous question. First call roll. Mr. Brennan. Yes. Mr. Rickerman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Mr. McDowell. It. Yes. I'm sorry. Ms. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Ms. Devine? Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Item 29, resolution number R-2021-053, approving the honorary naming of the 1900 and 2000 blocks of Cushman Drive, Bishop C.L. Warwick Sr. Drive. A motion. We'll move. A second. I'll, second. I'll second that. Uh, Sam, uh, Sam, Sam seconds the motion. Um, uh, well, well, well deserved. We miss, we miss, miss Josh something off. Yeah. Miss him something off. Um, uh, no discussion. Question of Kirk Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Ms. Devine? Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Mayor Benjamin, um, if you would please open public input, which is his only public input that council will receive, no action on the closing and transfer of the described property. 
um, which is resolution number R2020-2021-050, public input on closing and transferable portion of Phillips Street from Sunset Drive to Avondale Drive. All right, um, we open this, uh, uh, this meeting for public input. We have uh, Ms. Grijalas, any, uh, who's, uh, anyone who signed up or, or called in for public input on, on the closing and transfer of the street? Yes, sir. We have one person on the queue, and we'll be connecting them, and if they can um, introduce themselves. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Am I on now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma thank you very much. Uh, I'm Bonita Lorik Moultrie, and uh, I just. Thank the Lord uh, for each one of you. I'm so impressed with the meeting that we have witnessed today. And I just want to thank Mayor Benjamin and Councilman McDowell in particular and his staff and also Councilman Sam Davis in helping us to uh, get the approval of the honorary naming of the 1900 and 2000 block of Christian Drive to Bishop C.L. Lorick Sr., who is the father of uh, Bishop Josh Lorick, whom all of you know. Thank you so much uh, for your unanimous approval. And I would like to say that the event that we're having on tomorrow, the ceremony, we are recognizing uh, the uh, social distancing, uh, six feet apart. For those of you who will be attending, you will be uh, asked to wear your mask. And uh, if you do not feel comfortable in attending, we are fine with that. Uh, and we let everyone know that we understand how you feel. I have a 91-year-old mother now, and we're careful how we let her go. But she'll be there because this is, um, Bishop is her husband, so she'll certainly be there on tomorrow to witness the ceremony for the honorary um, renaming of the street of Cushion Drive to Bishop C. Alaric senior drive. So thank you everyone um, for your consent again. And I would also like to make one other observation as you were going forth in your business and the reading of the various ordinances, uh, especially the one relating to cons the consumption of beer and wine. It seems to me that uh, in your uh, putting forth all of your concerns as it relates to vaccination, COVID-19, that wearing a mask, that in the beginning when you all were looking at the safety of the community, that you would have put on hold the consumption of alcohol, beer, and wine while we are going through this COVID-19 uh, season. You know, when people get ready to celebrate, as um, uh, Councilman McDowell alluded to, everybody's going to get happy. I'm not an, an alcohol person, but I do know that your personality change whenever you take on another substance. So it seems to me that you all would have considered putting alcohol consumption on hold until we were free and safe and going all the way through the COVID-19 season with everything clear. You know, in other words, um, uh, that everything is safe now and you can go back to business as usual. As you all said earlier, we're not um, going, we have not gotten back to normal yet. So why are you approving alcohol consumption with all of these celebrations and when we're still in a be safe mode? I will let you know that if when you come to the celebration tomorrow, if you choose to with for um, the ceremony for Bishop Lawrence Sr., that we will gladly um, 
give you water. <laughs> and uh, and that is a safe thing. You will have water because it will be hot. It will be thirsty. And we will be rejoicing because this is a celebratory time whenever uh, when we celebrate someone who has done so much uh, in the community. So I just want to thank you for your time and thank you for uh, your consent to remain Kushner Drive to this portion of it, to Bishop C.L.R. Senior Drive. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. For the, uh, the only uh, probably two most powerful words in the Southern Dictionary other than thank you or yes, ma'am. Uh, so <laughs> we got to take that yes, ma'am, and, and, and thank you for that clarification. I drove down I drove down Cushman today and was thinking about our agenda, and, and I, I'm thinking, I knew we named something after after, after Josh already uh, on, on, on Beltline, but thank you for the clarification uh, that that we are uh, recognizing Bishop uh, Lark, the, the, the elder, and just really want to thank your entire family for uh, generational um, uh uh, commitment uh, uh, to, to to this this community. Uh, so 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 thank you and 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 we uh, we appreciate being taken to the woodshed. Yes, ma'am. All right. So thank you. And, and I would, I, my only my only submission would be uh, in addition to water, at least throw some Kool Aid and some sweet tea in there for some people. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, uh, any other public uh, comment, um, lady on the. Um, on on resolution 2021-50? Uh, we have one person with their hand up. Just want to make sure that this is for the public input on number 30, resolution 2021-50. If you have any other comments in regards to the agenda, we do have a public input um, session towards the end. I will join in the caller. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, sir. We hear you, sir. Go ahead, sir. Hello, Ed. this is Chris Freeman of Fox and Freeman Tree Company. Am I on? Yes, you are, Chris. Yes. Hey, Chris. Okay, I'm sorry. I am sorry. Hey, Albert, how are y'all doing? Councilman Davis. Uh, yes, first sir. of all, I just want to thank you for the opportunity just to speak to y'all for just a brief moment on this resolution. Um, as you some of you may know our corporation, may be familiar with us, but we are a 73-year-old company uh, doing business in South Carolina in the city of Columbia. And we are located at 3615 Phillips Street. And we also occupy the older residence of the Burkett family, which is 1216 Miller Avenue. Now, I have spoken to the um, others, many others about this resolution and what this is going to do to our business. Um, it is going to cause some some trauma. It's going to cause some aggravation for our business, not only mine, but there are two other businesses located on Phillips Street uh, that are going to suffer greatly if this street is closed without the resolution that we can get intersections of Cook and Miller widen at where they intersect North Main. So far, I've not been given any guarantee of that. And I've also understand from traffic engineering that they are recommending now they are approving the plan, the traffic study, and the closing of Phillips Street. But they're also asking that the developer fund fund the development of these intersections or changing of the widening, the turning radius of these intersections. Um, we haven't been given any guarantees. So what I'm asking you tonight is think about older businesses like ours, established businesses that's going to pay the price long term and just say, no, this has got to be tabled. This has got to be put aside. This cannot be passed until the companies that have been a, uh, a landmark in this community are protected. So um, I hope you understand my point of view on this. And again, I am not against the development of what the Middletons are proposing. Um, in no way would I be against that. It's only going to increase our property value, but I don't want it to come at the expense of the company or the other companies involved where we have more trouble with ingressing and egressing. So please consider that. I felt like last night with the planning commission meeting that all the comments that we made were pushed aside and it was they approved it. So I'm asking you to stand up and say, look, 
we got to protect those that have been there for quite a while and those that will suffer greatly. If this is closed, Phillip Street is closed without a resolution, a guarantee that we have uh, a better avenue of ingress and egress. Okay, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. So much. Thank, thank you. Um, the, uh, no, uh, it may be, uh, and maybe later on when we do uh, public input on, on, on items like this, we'll put it closer to the end of the agenda uh, uh, as well. Uh, but lady, if we have any, if we have no one no one else assigned to speak, um, we'll, we'll go ahead. I think we're not, there's no action. I understand you said Teresa just yet on this. Position? No, sir. You you all won't take any action. You'll never take action, but you'll need to discuss with the city attorney. Um, you know where you are as a council on mm -hmm. this item, but it, this will go to court. To be Mayor Benjamin, there is one more person on the line, and I also have one comment, one brief comment to read into the record. Uh, is it Same on topic? This, on, is it on this matter? Or we, we got we've got on 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 the close on the public input on the closing and transfer of the street, or is it on something else? Um, the comment is on the closing, and I would have to ask the person to make sure that they are going to speak on the um, public closing. All right, well, let's okay. just go. Ahead. Just in case, let's plan to go ahead and do all public comment now. Um, so you get, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, lady. Um, let's let this last citizen, uh, uh, or at least at, at this point, have, have their say on the agenda, and then, and then we'll have um, uh, that other comment read into the record. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, yes, uh, we can hear you. Please introduce yourself. Uh, this is Jim Daniel with Catawba Properties. Hey, Jim. A uh, brief comment. Uh, yesterday, the Planning Commission basically approved the site plan contingent on the developer, the city, and the South Carolina Department of Transportation to work out some avenue to increase the radii at Cook and Maine and Cook and uh, Miller. Left unsaid in that uh, is who's going to pay for that? Um, the city traffic engineer had suggested the developer pay for that. Uh, one potential possibility is the Middletons are building, uh, placing parking in what is Phillip Street, uh, which is owned by the city of Columbia. Uh, perhaps there could be some fee created for these parking spaces. Those funds could be then used to pay for the increasing of the radii at Maine and Cook and Maine and Miller. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bannon. Can, have... can, we, can we go ahead and read that last, read the written comment to the record, lady? Yes, sir. Um, I have a written comment from uh, Mr. Charles Sally. Um, on the public input on closing, stating, I am the owner of 1220 Cook Avenue. My tenant, Real Floors Inc., has told me that he has suppliers that will not come to his warehouse if Phillip Street is closed because the turn radius from Maine to Cook Avenue and the turn radius from Cook to Phillip Street is not adequate to accommodate a truck. The closing of this public road will place burden on the other property owners that use those streets, that use those streets, and that's all. And that is all the comments for item number 30. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, do we need to have any further discussion on the, on the item as a council, Ms. Wilson? Uh, no, well, I think Mr. Davis has his hand raised, but yes, Mr. Mayor, we do have an opportunity for you all to discuss an executive session. Go ahead, Sam. Or, or now. Or oh, well, that's all right. I, I could wait till executive session. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Keep it moving. Okay. A period of appointments. One item, the Midlands Authority for Conventions. Is y'all okay if we hold on, on the convention center uh, this week? Uh, yes. I'd, like, I'd like to hold the first. Right. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. All right. We have the Heath Matters. Uh, other matters, item 32, the diversity internship program to be uh, presented by the Honorable Mayor Pro Tem Edward H. McDowell Jr. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. I think um, I think we forwarded all of you all uh, a presentation reference in the diversity internship program. After further conversation with our city manager um, and several others regarding that funding request of $24,000, um, we've, we've sort, of, sort of convinced that it's not an expense that we could use taxpayers' dollars with. Uh, and the only way we could perhaps do that is through hospitality tax dollars. I've had a conversation with uh, Bill Ellen uh, referencing this program, this diversity program. And if you know anything about it, I was introduced to the program by the director of adversity at Carolina, of course, and uh, very innovative, very uh, interactive, uh, but we need some money for students who are in the hospitality hospitality uh, industry and their only their only job of course is not to fill coffee cups or pass out donuts but to look at higher levels of hospitality and of course this internship would provide that we're not asking for any funding of course we wish we could get some hospitality tax dollars and um, and if we couldn't do $24,000, we could very well knock down the number of interns for this 10 week program. Uh, very innovative. Um, I think one of the kind, the kind of program that lends itself to diversity and to those students who are in that particular major. So, it would be good if we couldn't do $24,000 to at least do some, do some funding for that. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Daniel, I was calling you. I was on mute. Uh, um, well, two things. I, I read about the program and I actually called Bill Ellen. I think this originally started with an ask to the University of South Carolina. And it's a management program where there is a lack of, of diversity in the management restaurant field, especially in Columbia, from the studies that have been done. Um, I'm so how this some of this should be coming from the university in the their program and do have a whole hospitality thing. The second part is, you know. I know that Sarah Simmons is having a hard time getting personnel in to her program that we committed to already. I'm wondering if we couldn't uh, sign some of these kids to work with her and Aaron and her management team to get the training there, which would cut down the dollars that would be needed. Um, you know, I think there's there's some other ways. I think hospitality is the only way that you can move this forward. Um, and, and it sounds like the, the dollar might be less, but I do think we need to understand why the McCutcheon House is not being used as part of the program. And, you know, it maybe it will help Sarah. I think she had committed to like 50 graduates and, and I think she's been struggling getting people in. Maybe we could get some of that there and kind of spread it out, which would reduce the dollar amount that we're looking for, because I don't know what we have in hospitality. But I think that's the only way that you could move the program forward that way. Well, I, some of that I agree with, Daniel. The other piece, of course, is that the program we are talking about is one that that caters to and uh, pigeonhole uh, ethnic African American students in the hospitality industry. I just said. I didn't hear you. I said that's what I said. Oh, oh okay. That's the part I didn't hear. Um, I think it's very innovative. I think it's one of the programs that helps our city expand itself. And of course, 
uh, those students who are in that industry, in that major area, uh, provide some real opportunities for us. So whether it, whether it comes through the convention, whether it comes through Bill Ellen, or whether we can help in some kind of way accentuate this uh, endeavor, it will certainly be of advance for us, advantage for us, and advantage for our city. Can we, uh, can we uh, facilitate that conversation? I mean, it could be God to see um, what, what we're both talking about. We had some challenges pre-pandemic. Uh, now, obviously, because of the pandemic and also because of the, you know, the overwhelming uh, federal response in terms of, of, of uh, assistance sure. to citizens, uh, we, I mean, we got these macro forces that are just, you know, um, uh, creating a, a real challenge for a lot of our, our folks in the hospitality industry, just the ability to attract and keep um, 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 talent. Uh, so uh, can we uh, have that conversation with Sarah? Obviously, if, if the folks are not being... Um, uh, Absolutely. I think he might have lost power. Yeah. Mayor, can you hear us? So if, of course, if we could have that conversation and sort of, sort of let it become a collaborative movement with Sarah and the students. Yeah, yeah. We could, I mean, we could very well do that. My, my contention is that we need to do something. Uh, I, I don't I, disagree with you. There's I, a I'm not sure where I got, where I got lost there. Uh, I, I think, and I apologize for interrupting both of you. I, I, think we, I think we're singing from the same hymn the question is how we get there. We got we got macro we got macro issues affecting the industry um, 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 before the pandemic only made worse by the pandemic and then obviously the significant amount of federal capital coming into people's pockets is also affecting uh, folks you know come, uh, wanting to, to 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 work in the space. If if there's funding out there, uh, particularly funding uh, set aside for the program we're working with uh, Sarah on, that's not being utilized, then maybe there is a real opportunity there either through her program or, or through this other program. So let's at least let's at least get that conversation going. Whoever, I mean, let's say, uh, Teresa, maybe yeah, Ryan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have to do about the hospitality funding if there is some for the program, if we want to move forward so we know what kind of dollar amount we could possibly put towards it. Because it's yeah. going to take multiple. It's yeah. not going to, it's not going to be. I'd love to find the money. I'd love to find the money as well. Even if I know we got a little, oh, usually have a little latitude. Again, I'm not sure about the use of funds, Teresa, you know, we've always, uh, we got that little uh, marketing tax, it was ATAX and, and the like, uh, you know, uh, right. let, so, but maybe that maybe, it, so maybe it's ATAX and not HTAX. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I'd love to find the funding for this as well. It's not a lot of money that could go, that could go a very long way in terms of career development for these young people. So let's see what we can do. Or uh, make, right. that, make that connection with Sarah, Mr. Rickman, Mayor, Reverend McDowell. Yeah. That Would you, could well, we have that? Her and, and Bill and you know because if, if it doesn't work for her program then we're gonna have to lean on hospitality but there is a need uh, he's exactly mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. I do I do want to say if any of those kids are out there watching and they look just the toasty spot with Cy Williams and Eli Wright two young African Americans gonna open up a place in the old lunchbox on Lady Street they're 23 and 25 y'all that's a celebration right there I think I heard about that. Wilson, could we could we engender that conversation? Let's, let's see if yes. we get some progress on that between now and next meeting. Yes, sir. Can we do that? Yes, Thank sir. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. That Thank is you. my that is my report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. All right. Um let me see manager. Item 33, council is asked to approve the installation of seven speed humps in the Hollywood Rose Hill neighborhood as requested by the Public Works Department. We, we cool with that, Mr. Brennan? We good? To approve. Yes, please. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? We'll move the previous question. Kurt Colorado. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. DeWall? Aye. Ms. Devine? Aye. <coughs> Mr. Davis? Aye. Mayor Benjamin? Aye. Thank you, ma'am. 
You're welcome. Uh, committee uh, uh, reports. Any uh, any referrals or reports from committee? Mr. Mayor, yes, when, do we take, when do we take up the motion for half uh, the teeth? We can do it now or, or, or after the report. Either one. Do it whenever, whenever you're comfortable. All right. Yeah, but um, do we have any reports? I think I think I think they're going to want to be in the same time, and we don't think we have any reports or referrals. Uh, as Brian gave us earlier on. So, all right, all right. Uh, let's um, let's rock and roll, Mr. McDowell. Well, TK did follow me uh, a motion. Is she is TK online? I she is. Is. is she is she online? Is I she am. here? Ms. Wilson? Yeah. All right, I'm trying to find it again. <laughs> and um, since I can't find it, don't do it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, you wanna, you God wanna, is speaking I'm, to you, you Ed. Wanna, you wanna, you wanna that forward is a the, sign. You wanna, is that a sign? Well, well, you know, well, if that's the case, somewhere I read, no sign shall be given. <laughs> Um, send it to your email again. Is it your email? You, uh, would you copy me as well, Teresa? Or send me a copy. I think she did initially. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you have that, Mr. Mayor? I don't. I don't have it. Okay. I read it and. Um, What's the intent? Two twenty-five. Uh, the, the 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 one you sent two twenty-five. Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa. That's it. That's it. Is the current That's one. It. That's it. Would you like me to? Uh, Would you read uh, that, Mr. Mayor? Um, yes, yes, sir. Um, I'd like to request that the matter. Can the mayor do that? Uh, on, the, on the prevailing side, on the, so losing side rather. Uh, well, he's reading it for Ed. The motion is being made uh, by Ed. Are we, are, with <laughs> oh, he's with his translator, Mr. Benjamin, reading it uh, for him. On behalf of the mayor pro tem. Uh, <laughs> oh, right. Request that the, the matter of the of project Catawba include of the project Catawba inclusion in the multi-county industrial park be added to the next available agenda. I request that the a matter be added in order to consider a new ordinance which will address our prior concerns with the matter. Is that your motion, Mr. Mr. McDowell? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, second. Second. All right. All right. I'm moving second in discussion. So, so just Mr. Mayor, so, so I'm clear, we are going to hear the new ordinance with the new profile of this development uh, at the next agenda. Is that what Ed's requesting? Yeah, my understanding, and I, and I would encourage, uh, and this would be my, 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 my admonition to all parties involved. I, I know that the developers want, want to speak uh, to um, all of us on this. I think they haven't had a chance to speak to, to, to each of us. And um, I, I know there have been some concerns raised about everything from affordable housing and, and, and some of the other challenges that 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 obviously did not yield a broad support this last time around. Um, I, I would encourage you to engage, engage with with engage with developers. Um, uh, those conversations that have been had and issues agreed to to maybe improve upon uh, the, the the project. Um, uh, let's let's get those modified in a way that allows us to, to transparently communicate those to the public uh, as soon as possible um, so we can have it on on the on the next uh, uh, agenda but let's keep dialoguing and you know maybe we'll get there maybe we won't um, and, we might miss mr. Brennan please yes sir and, and they will be available for residents to reach out to as well is that correct sir that's correct uh, okay all right uh, any other feedback on this yeah, I'm sorry I, I can't see the questions uh, Miss, uh, I'm sorry. Did you have something, Madam City Manager? I can ask after your action. Okay. Move the previous question, Clerk Colwell. Mr. Brendan. Yes. Mr. Rickman. Aye. Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duval. Aye. Ms. Devine. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Thank you. TK, let me just say a word of thanks. I just got it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Mr. Yeah. Mayor, I, yes, I have, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tamika. Oh, 
Well, I was just going to say that I know that part of our discussion last week was whether or not this council still wanted to move forward with having um, an incentive when it deals with primarily student housing. I think that this development kind of got in that. And so I do think that we need to have a conversation uh, whether or not we want to sunset that or at least make it clear before we have developers spending millions of dollars down the road um, and there's not an inclination among this council to want to support such a thing. So I would ask that we have that, that discussion and, and make that clear sooner rather than later, hopefully maybe at the next meeting when we have this discussion, Mr. Mayor. And can, um, thank you. And can we, can we make sure we have that discussion in a, in a, um, I mean, like a discussion, a form, um, informed dialogue, informed data from, from Ryan and everything. I've been pretty clear and consistent on where I've stood this thing. It hadn't had changed since we passed the, uh, uh, the, the incentive and, 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 and um, it is the same today. I know that we've had uh, varying uh, uh, opinions, um, but I think let's, let's just make sure it's a, it's a good discussion, whether it's in this meeting uh, coming up or maybe just to, to make sure we don't conflate the issues. Uh, maybe, 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 maybe the one after that, but, but one very soon. Uh, uh, I, I know it's something that Mr. Brennan um, wanted to bring up uh, as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Mr. May. I, and I'm, I, I think this would be a good opportunity to, 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 to take the next two weeks to learn more about the new programming for the Catawba Street project and get neighborhood input. And then uh, the next meeting, let's really dig into the summaries of what, what student housing has done for uh, economic development. Uh, the, the, the student housing sunset should have happened, but I, I feel like they are still coming through in this multi-industrial the $30 million. I hear uh, every other day the frustrations of, of, of these large student housing in my districts uh, yeah. and just want to bring that bring that forward in the form of a, um, you know, an agenda item at the next meeting. I'll be bringing that forward. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's again, let's make sure we, we stage them. And I know Mr. McDowell's uh, intention is for this Catawba project to be on the next agenda. Uh, so, right. so, 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 Mr. Brennan, if it's if it's this next agenda or the one after that, let's just make sure we got. Let, let's make sure we have uh, again all the data. And Ryan and, and Ryan and Teresa, you know what we're looking for. I'm just looking for numbers. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, we got all these discussions going on around about about the the influence of of of, of non property tax paying uh, entities in, in in the city, and we've been able to add hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, now, I, I, I would, I would um, um, uh, agree, obviously, uh, all development is not good development. And, and we, and we got to make sure it's thoughtful and sustainable and marries up with, with, with who we are, what we want to be in the city. Uh, I do, however, believe that, um, uh, that, that um, smart, um, vertical uh, uh, student housing that has tax rolls and, and not on universities' uh, books is, is, is better uh, than the, uh, the alternative, but I think there's a whole lot of room for, um, for some uh, involved disagreement there. Uh, let, let's have the conversation as a, as a council with all the information we can possibly have. So it would, it would be great to look at the, um, the beginning of when we, when we introduced the ordinance, uh, the, um, uh, the aggregate number of, of projects done uh, under it uh, since then, maybe even because like, we, we did discuss uh, the sunset some time ago. Um, um, uh, and, uh, uh, I don't remember kind of where we left it then. But let's look at it. Let's look at it again at the, uh, um, uh, at the very least, I'd like to see all the different numbers that, that we have pretty, pretty comprehensive checklist uh, that we looked at. They need to be uh, updated, I would say, for yeah, occupancies yeah. and everything. Yeah. Absolutely. The above, but it'd be great to get maybe over the next couple of weeks to get an update on that. Uh, okay. I just wanted to let you know, I'll be back to, to that after um, Mr. McDowell's in, in we, a couple of weeks. We know, Mr. Brennan. We know. We do, we know you're ready, uh, Mr. And Mr. Rickman. Uh, see your hand. Yeah, I just I wanted to make sure that the the changes and the and the new items that everybody discussed, new improved security plan, parking agreements on whatever was discussed from housing oh. units to whatever that we get that information sooner than later. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen, I haven't seen those yet either, Mr. Rickman. I mean, I like to see those too. Um, Whatever they are, that that was my clarity. I needed, that's, Mayor. That's I heard part. you all mentioning next meeting and then the following meeting. So remember that you meet actually on May 11th. So you literally meet in one week again, and then you meet for your regular two week meeting on the 18th. 
So in one week period, are you wanting this information sharing? And I, and I think I heard also for the purpose of the public on the Catawba Street project. Or I, think, next I, I think whenever, whenever the articulated um, uh, concessions made by the developer uh, in, in discussions with, with, with us, we need to see those today. I mean, I think I think I mean I think council obviously needs to see those ASAP later. Yeah, 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 yeah ASAP. If they if they if they've been laid out, let, let's 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 all let's all see them. I, I, I again, I've I voted in favor, so I was fine with with the art with it as uh, originally proposed. But uh, if it has been significantly improved, and I think that's 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 a good thing. Uh, let's so let's 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 keep it um let's keep it moving. But that is the anticipation is that it will be on the next agenda. Uh, but this the larger discussion about about whether or not we we keep or sunset the the, the ordinance, uh, I, I think having all that information in advance of the the meeting on the uh, 18th, uh, when prepare for discussion there would be uh, would be appropriate. Uh, Ms. Wilson, well, that, Matt, yeah, I think sir. Will is right on point because we've talked we've talked years back about the sunset of student housing, and I think what you want us to do. And I think you articulated, and I think you got your facts down probably pretty well for this to come for this conversation to ensue itself. There's been there's been many sunsets, but yet there's been a lot of sunrises. And of course, I think what you want to get at is how do we get how do we maintain that balance, man? And um, so so. I'm, and so along, that conversation along the lines along the lines of Lorik's uh, presentation earlier, would you would you vote to approve these events if there's no alcohol involved? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Just, I'm, I'm I, I'm 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 hey, no need to ask that. Look, no I want that. I want some I want some red Kool Aid. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Um, we okay, Ms. Wilson? I think so. Yes, sir. I'll, we'll work with the developer. I'll have Ryan um, get the information because I I have not seen it, nor did you know. I don't think staff was aware of this. So this part. We'll do our best to get it to you in short order, and um, you know, other than it being noticed on the Friday agenda dissemination. I'm not sure if you were suggesting we put it out. No, 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 that that's okay. That's more than that's more than appropriate. But 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 if there's information, obviously, you know, um, Will or Daniel or Howard, all of us, it, we should have that information to share with with constituents. Uh, Absolutely. If, if there've been some other concessions made that might give um, citizens um, um, more comfort, let let's yeah. have it. We can share it. So let's 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 get that all in one place. Okay. Right. Well, see, I think I think, Mr. Mayor, all of us didn't receive this. All of this, all of us did not receive this, and that's one of the reasons. I don't think anybody has anyone else seen this. I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not that. seen it. Yeah, that's my that's my point. That's my point, and I think all. If I've seen it, I think all of us need to see that. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, thank thank, thank you. We all we all one accord, or at least six six or seven consistent accords. So let's 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 let's, let's, let's keep our rocket rolling, Ms. Wilson. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I assume I assume no more public input because we we got it all already, right? Is that is that is that right, Ms. Gray Hollis? Are we good? Yes, sir. We don't have anybody um, signed up for public input right now. Super super duper. All right. Thank thank you, lady. And I know the the. the uh, Eric is um, um, I'll probably monitoring as well. Uh, thank, 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 thank um, her for training you in such an able way. Did a great job uh, today, and uh, thank you for your for your um, for your work. Um, uh, Mr. Duval, you have a motion for me? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. I move we go into executive session for receipt of legal advice related to matters covered by attorney-client privilege pursuant to SE Code 30-4-70A2 COVID-19 CDBG. DR grant program closing and transfer of a portion of Phillips Street from Sunset Drive to Avondale Drive. Discussion of the employment of an employee pursuant to SC Code 30 4 70A1, Special Assistant United States Attorney. 
uh, discussion of negotiations, incident proposed contractual arrangements pursuant to SC code 30-4-70A2, Dominion franchise, and uh, discussion of a personnel, well, personnel salaries uh, pursuant to 30-4-70A1, um, and under that, we would discuss personnel salaries and fire. Thank you, Mr. Duvall. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion, we'll move the previous question, call the roll. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Rickerman? Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Duvall? Aye. Ms. Devine. Ms. Devine. Aye. Mr. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mayor Benjamin. Aye. Thank you. Thank you so much.